let's get started. That sounds better, right? And there's no shrieking voice or sound coming from coming from the static. Okay, we're going to continue from where we left off last time, although I did some reordering uh, in the lectures that were planned. I gave you a static schedule earlier, but we're going to do a different dynamic schedule just because how things worked out. So before we start, uh, I have office hours tomorrow. If you want to stop by for some reason, stop by during that time. And if you need to meet me for some other reason, you should schedule, uh, schedule accordingly. And you can do that over email or by talking to me. Of course, email is not always reliable, so you can transmit, but you may not get a response, right? <laughs> it's good to retransmit multiple times or find some other way of doing things. Okay, this is what we covered last time in the last lecture. Uh, we talked a lot about caching. That's why today I want to switch to something different, and we're going to come back to caching later. Uh, we talked about effective cache design, uh, memory level parallelism, and miss buffers. We, we stopped at the miss buffers. Uh, hopefully you know all of these concepts. All of these are important concepts in today's microprocessors. Uh, today, this is the goal. Uh, I stopped over here, actually, enabling high bandwidth memories. We'll talk about high bandwidth memories a little bit, because that's everywhere. Caches, register files, memory, you need high bandwidth. And there are some fundamental techniques to enable high bandwidth memories. We'll look at the trade-offs. And then we will start main memory. Uh, I promised that we would start uh, multi-core issues in caching, but I will defer that to future because multi-core issues in memory and caching is best covered later on, in my opinion. Uh, and I think it's good for you to get a broad overview of the main memory system before we cover the resource sharing, quality of service type of issues. And we will, uh, first I'll give you a broad perspective, some of the issues, some of which you've seen before, but some of which you have not seen. And then we'll talk about DRAM fundamentals and operation and memory controllers. Does that sound good? Okay, it's an aggressive agenda, so we'll see how much of it we'll cover. Okay, this is a review of one thing that we've studied last time, basically for you to just refresh your minds. We're not going to talk about this in this lecture, but we talked about hybrid cache replacement. But this is an example of heterogeneous policy because no single policy provides the highest performance. And as we've discussed, we, the idea here was to implement both policies and pick the one that is expected to perform best at runtime. So you do it dynamically, basically. Uh, and we discussed how to do that, right? There are trade-offs associated with it. And this is a general thing, basically. Whenever you have two different policies, usually you have different workloads doing well with the different policies, and maybe you have different times during the execution of workload that is doing well with a particular policy and sometimes doing well with some other particular policy. So the idea is to implement multiple policies and select the best during runtime. And you will see this over and over. And we will talk about this in the memory system also. This doesn't apply only to policies, but to different technologies, for example, or to different things, if you will, to different cores also. Does it make sense to have a large core and replicate it to get a multi-core system, or does it make sense to get a small core and replicate it for a multi-core system? Well, why not have both types? both a large core and a small core. And when the workload needs the large core, use the large core. When the workload needs the small core, use the small core. This is already happening. ARM's uh, big little system is an example of it. But as I said much earlier, IBM implemented something uh, like this, a heterogeneous multi-core processor. So that the concept of heterogeneity is very pervasive uh, in the systems we design today. So it's going to, things are going to become more heterogeneous. And this is one example of heterogeneous policies and heterogeneity and hybrid, same idea. Okay, so you have this assigned reading, which we didn't give you a due date yet, but we're going to put the required readings uh, on the hot, hot crap system. It's called hot CRP, but the person who developed it actually called it hot crap. <laughs> this is actually the conference review package. Uh, it's basically, that's, that's why CRP, uh, but you can add an A in between. Uh, it's, it's, that's the system that's used by almost all major conferences to review papers. So we're going to put, the, uh, put all of the required papers over there so that you can do the reviews as we've discussed. How many of you have logged into the system? Okay, good. Is it easy to use? Okay, that well, should be pretty reasonable. Okay, we, we, we don't have due dates on some of these, but feel free to do them. I mean, we'll eventually give you 
You, I know you're not here for the grades, but we'll eventually give you extra credit for the, for the stuff that you do. Don't worry. <laughs> okay, let's jump into enabling high bandwidth memories. So uh, why do we want high bandwidth? Well, one, one reason is processors can generate multiple cache and memory access per cycle, and we've seen how to support that in the cache, uh, right? This is the idea of memory level parallelism. And also non-blocking caches support that memory level parallelism. So how do we ensure the cache and memory can handle multiple access in the same clock cycle? We've talked about the missed buffers, but there should be more, right? The substrate itself needs to deliver you multiple accesses. So there, we're going to go over several solutions, uh, a combination of which is implemented in multiple uh, systems. Some of them are harder to do at this point. Uh, true multiporting, virtual multiporting, multiple cache copies, and banking interleaving. So true multiporting and banking are very heavily used in today's systems, but these other solutions are interesting solutions, and they give you uh, the space of architecting memories, uh, and they were used at some point in the past. Maybe they're used also today in some, in some uh, designs. Who knows? Okay, the first idea, if you want to access, this is a memory cell. Uh, if you want to access uh, this memory cell, in this case, it's an SRAM cell, as you can see, right? It's two cross-coupled inverters. And then two access transistors over here. Uh, this is one port, right? You have two access transistors such that you have the bit line and the bit line bar, and then you can sense that data. Now, if you want to be able to uh, have multiple accesses, you have multiple ports, right? This is called true multiporting. Each memory cell has multiple read or write ports. In this case, it's a read port, right? So maybe when you're reading from this cell, another cell, you're reading using the other port, bit line two. That way, you can actually sustain two accesses from two different cells. That's the idea. Now, what is the downside of this? As you can see, well, what's the upside? You can perfectly get two accesses. You're reading from this cell using this bit line, you're using from the other, uh, reading from some other cell using the other bit line, so you have two truly concurrent accesses that way, right? You multiported the cell. Of course, this comes at a cost. The cost is latency, power, and area. <laughs> well, clearly, you've doubled uh, the access circuitry, as you can see over here. Instead of one access transistor on each side, you have two access transistors. Instead of one bit line on each side, you have two bit lines. And also, you need uh, increased latency because now you're sensing the same parts in the circuit, and so you have actually extra electrical loading over here, and the power also increases. And to make it work as fast as a single port, you actually need to increase the area as well. So this is expensive, uh, and also there are other issues related to this, which is, what if, you, what, what if you want to read and write to the same location at the same time? Well, this doesn't help you with that at all. In fact, this makes your life harder if you actually <laughs> do the wrong thing. So there's no other way of fixing this other than having some peripheral logic that detects the fact that you need to read and write from the same location at the same time. So you really need the dependency check logic, if you will. And that could be implemented outside the memory or inside the memory. That depends, right? For example, you could figure that out before you send the memory access into the memory and say, oh, I'm going to do the read first and then the write first, depending on what the order is required from the program. Uh, but one way of doing it inside the memory is, uh, as you can see, you basically have some semaphore cells that say, oh, if you're going to read and write at the same time, you need to, you cannot do it. You need to order it somehow. That's one example that I picked up from the web. But that's the idea. You have dual port, but the semaphore cells need to ensure that you cannot do read and write to the same uh, cell at the same time. And this is one example of this. But there are other ways of doing it. So the CPU can arbitrate and ensure that the memory is not written and read from the same location at the same time, right? Or written and written at the same time. So that's a dependency. Okay, so that's true part multiporting. And this is one way of uh, supporting multiple accesses. But there are many other ways. One other is, again, an engineer is someone who does for a dime what any fool can do for a dollar, right? Well, we don't want that extra port. How do we get it? Well, we virtually multiport. The idea over here is timeshare a single port. If you can afford to do it, uh, do the first access in the first half of the clock cycle and do the second access in the second half of the clock cycle, let's say. That way you can actually do two accesses in a given cycle. You need to design your memory to support it. And your ac each access needs to be significantly shorter than this clock cycle in this case, right? Basically, you need to make this work. I'm not going to go, going to go into the details of how to make it work, but it's possible to make it work, and it's actually used in one of the flagship processors of its time, 
alpha 21 to 64, so that you can get high bandwidth from the data cache of that processor. This was the fastest processor. Uh, it had the highest frequency of its time, like 500 megahertz in the 1990s, 1996 or so. And there's a beautiful paper about it, which I may recommend later on. Uh, of course, the upside is clearly you don't have an extra port, but you need some design complexity to make sure that this works. The downside is, is this scalable? What if you want four accesses per cycle? Well, <laughs> can you really sustain to have only uh, one-fourth of the clock cycle and achieve one access in that one-fourth? What if you want 16 accesses per clock cycle? 32, 64. Clearly, this is not scalable, right? Well, it could be scalable if your clock cycle is really long. <laughs> but if you're designing a good system, hopefully that's not the case, right? And usually, the data cache access is one of the determinants of your clock cycle. So this is hard to scale. And wh wh why would we want 64 accesses per clock cycle? Let's think about a superscalar processor where you can issue, let's say, eight instructions per cycle at a given time. Right? And they all need to access two registers. So 8 times 2 is 16. You already have 16 uh, accesses per cycle to the register file. OK. So another solution, uh, which is perhaps more scalable than this one, is this. Basically, the picture shows it all. Uh, instead of having one copy, have two copies of memory. In this case, cache. It could be register file. It could be whatever. If you have two copies that are identical, you can do the first load from this copy and the second load from this copy, right? Essentially, you can do two loads per cycle in this case. That's good. The, uh, of course, you need to ensure that the data is consistent. So if you have a store, it updates both locations, both replicas, if you will, and that becomes the bottleneck over here, right? Loads can proceed in parallel, though. That's nice. Uh, and this is also used in a previous version of the alpha uh, processor, uh, 21164, which is not the out of order version, but in order, superscalar version. And they essentially did this. Makes sense, right? Cool. Again, there's a scalability issue over here. If you want to scale this to many, many ports, now your area increases proportionally, right? Before it was time, your time needs to diminish proportionally. Now it's space, right? The space needs to increase proportionally to support the ports. And also, uh, store operations cause a bottleneck. Right. Now you need to actually show, uh, ensure that the store writes to all of those copies. OK. This is interesting because actually something like this, uh, not, not exactly like this, but something like this was also used in 21264. Uh, when I talk about 21264, that's one of the uh, very interesting out-of-order execution processors. That's why I keep talking about that. Uh, and it, th you had the register file, and there were two copies of the register file in different clusters. And they didn't keep them c perfectly consistent, meaning a store could write to this register file, and that store's data would go to the other register file only one cycle later. So it was the compiler's job to ensure that nobody read this register file <laughs> before it was written to. So you needed a scheduler in the compiler. Compiler needed to ensure that the instructions are ordered such way, such that the store that was done in this cluster, uh, the, a, a dependent instruction that is dependent on a store, uh, that a dependent, a, an instruction that's dependent on a store that was done in this cluster, was either sent to this cluster, or if it were sent to this cluster, it were delayed by at least one cycle from the execution of the store over here. So here you can see, you can actually play tricks, right? If you punt the problem on the software, the software can try to make your life easier. The store doesn't get, need to get reflected at the same cycle over here. Or you can perfectly partition. You can say, well, I'm not going to have all of the stores update here. You don't have a perfect replica then, right? OK. So the, the final solution that I'm going to discuss that's used in most processors today in some form is banking. And that's essentially this, but it's not a copy anymore. It's really a partition. Basically, you take the address space and you partition it into separate banks. Addresses, even addresses, let's say even addresses go here, odd addresses go here. You don't have this coherence problem between the stores because a store only updates data that's over here, right? And bits and address determines which bank an address maps to. 
In this case, you have two ports, so a bit, a single bit is ne uh, uh, necessary. So which bits to use for bank address uh, is an issue, right? This is similar to which bits to use for index into a cache, right? Because here, again, you can get conflicts. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay, so upside over here is no increase in data store area because you're partitioning it, you're not replicating it. So that's a big upside. The downside that you get is if, if two accesses go to this location, so you want to support two accesses from a load, two, two different loads, if they happen to access even addresses at the same time, well, tough luck. You have to serialize them. You, ca you cannot service them in parallel. So that's called a bank conflict. And the other issue over here is you need to have some interconnect in the input and output to do the routing, right? Here, when you have the replica, you don't need an interconnect. You can send any load over here and they get serviced because all of the addresses are here. Whereas here, you send a load over here that happens to be generated, but if it maps over here, you need to have a way of routing it that way, right? Because it's not a replica, it's a partition. Okay, and usually it's a crossbar interconnect but it doesn't have to be. We'll talk about interconnects later in lecture. But if it's a crossbar interconnect, then you, you make life easier, of course. Okay. Crossbar means any input is connected to any output directly. Okay. So bank conflicts. We've discussed this. Basically, if you have concurrent requests to the same bank, you have a conflict, and you need to somehow deal with it. One way of dealing with it is having peripheral logic, control logic, that serializes the accesses. Right? And that's usually how it's done. But there are other ways, other potential ways of dealing it. For example, one, one thing we've discussed is minimizing it, right? How do you minimize the bank conflicts? Again, go back to the caching lecture last time. You can use hashing in the bank, address, uh, bank bits, right? You can use a randomizing hash function that minimizes the probability of bank, access, uh, bank conflicts. Certainly that's possible. That's one way of doing it in hardware. Or maybe in software you can somehow try to schedule instructions such that things that are accessing even addresses are not scheduled at the same time, right? That's one way of doing it. That's possible also. So again, there are many potential ways of reducing it. Uh, okay, what else do I want to say? So is this a scalable solution? It's more scalable. Uh, it's as scalable as this interconnect, but it, at least the space is more scalable because you're partitioning the space. You're not replicating the space, right? But now your interconnect becomes a bottleneck as you keep scaling. So you, there's no free lunch, if you will. <laughs> All of these are different trade-offs. Make sense? Okay, we'll see this concept in this lecture more and more because memory is heavily banked today, for example. Register files are heavily banked. L1 caches, L2 caches, all of those are heavily banked to support multiple accesses. I mean, there's another benefit of doing this sort of banking. Uh, you can turn off banks, right? Today, we're in a power-limited environment. And if you predict that there is not going to be no access to a bank, you can turn it off for a while. You can turn off the clock such that you're not wasting energy and power. And if you, for example, happen to find out that uh, uh, you're not accessing one bank for a long time and you don't need the parallelism for some reason, you can turn it off for longer periods of time. So these tricks are employed uh, in modern systems because we're very power limited. It was developed for other reasons, of course, but you can actually take advantage of the fact that things are partitioned for power savings as well. Okay, so this is what I just described. is really a general principle. It's called banking. Well, not the banking in finance. <laughs> it's a different sort of banking. <laughs> Maybe not as lucrative. <laughs> Maybe it is, I don't know. But it's also called interleaving. And it's called, it's called interleaving because what you're really doing is you're interleaving addresses across these different partitions. So even addresses go here, odd addresses go here. But that's not the only way of interleaving these, right? You can say bank zero contains addresses that's at the top half of memory, zero through n divided by two, minus one. And bank one contains all of the uh, memory uh, that's at the bottom half or the top half, whatever, the other half, right? So that's another way of interleaving. The question is which one's better, right? And the other way of interleaving is having a hash function, right? That actually randomizes things. Okay, so th let, me, let me give you another look at this problem uh, because there is uh, one reason for banking is high bandwidth, but it's also good for low latency. And if you start from a different perspective, uh, your perspective is you, you want a huge memory and you can design a huge array, let's say. Instead of having two arrays like this, you basically have a huge long array. 
Now, the problem is that uh, that monolithic memory array takes too long to access because you need to activate the word line, and you need to activate the bit line, and that, that bit line is long. And that interconnect is one of the major limiters of latency today. That bit line is long, and it also doesn't enable multiple access in parallel if you have a single array, single ported. Uh, so if you want to reduce the latency of the memory array access and also enable multiple access in parallel, you go with banking. You divide the array into multiple banks that can be accessed independently, either in the same cycle or in consecutive cycles. And each bank is smaller than the entire memory storage. And access latencies to different banks can be overlapped that way. Make sense? So that's another perspective, right? First, I gave you the perspective of if you want multiple memory access, you partition this array. But if you want lower latency, you also partition that array. OK, a key issue, same issue as before. How do you map data to different banks? How do you interleave data across banks? So there's something over here that I didn't really discuss. This picture doesn't depict it really well. And this picture shows a crossbar interconnect. Maybe you can get rid of this crossbar interconnect if your accesses doesn't have to be concurrent in the exact same cycle. Right? If you can afford to start one access in one cycle and the next access in the other cycle and the next access in the other cycle, you don't need an interconnect. Uh, uh, well, at least you don't need to uh, have multiple buses, inputs and outputs that way. You still need to route the data, but you don't need to exercise all of them at the same time. Right? So you can, for example, deal with a bus that way. You need some sort of interconnect, of course. right? <laughs> Maybe not a crossbar, though. So you can have a single bus that is connected to bank zero and bank one. And at a given cycle, only one of them loads that bus. Make sense? So for example, for the inputs, let's say you have the address bus. And uh, it's not a crossbar anymore. Uh, you send one request. And then only one of, them re one of that requests gets enabled into this bank. Because you need an enable signal that enables this bank. But the bus also drives this one, but you don't enable it. You disable it, basically. Make sense? Well, it's a, it could be a single bus over here. And the output could be a single bus. Only the bank that is providing data in that cycle can enable, can drive that bus. Make sense? But this is, you, can, you can do this trick only if you don't need truly concurrent access in the same cycle. Right? You basically start one access in one cycle, the next access in the next cycle, and the next access, the next access in the next cycle. As long as the first access goes to bank zero, the next access goes to bank one, uh, the data of the first access comes one cycle after the bank latency, and the data for the next access comes one cycle after that. You can almost parallelize both of the accesses, but starting is happening every other cycle. Make sense? So hopefully that's clear. <laughs> okay, good. Any questions, you can shout at this moment. Okay, so uh, basically that's what this is uh, referring to. You either start accesses in consecutive cycles and still overlap most of the latency if your bank latency is dominant, or in the same cycle. In some cases, you cannot afford uh, to start accessing consecutive cycles, right? For example, if you're accessing a register file, and if you de designed your processor to issue eight instructions per cycle, if you serialize them, you're going to lose a lot of the benefit of that. So there, you really need multiple accesses per cycle. So this may not be a good idea, starting those accesses in consecutive cycles. Whereas in the memory side, and the register file access is also short compared to how long it takes to start the access, right? But if you are on the DRAM side, as we will see, the light latency of the bank is very long to begin with. So what is another cycle to start the access? <laughs> you start the first access in one cycle, the next access in the other cycle, for example. And also there are some other issues that we will discuss. So if you, if you have this crossbar, as you can see, it's costly. If you want to have eight banks, for example, you need to have eight inputs and eight places that you can connect each of those inputs to. Uh, but if you have a single bus, it's just a single line and just some driver's light. Right? So that's simple. We'll, you, this will be more clear when we cover the interconnects. Uh, so the cost is much less. Right? If you are able to start accesses every other cycle, your cost is, you can make your cost much less. And that's one of the main reasons why in DRAM, in the main memory, we'll start accessing consecutive cycles, whereas in the register file, we need to start accesses usually in the same cycle. OK. Any thoughts, questions, burning? Hopefully, this is simple, relatively. Good. But this is, I think, very interesting because it gives you all the tr interesting trade offs, design trade offs that you can make. How many of you have thought about virtual multi porting in the past? Doing 
one axis in half of the cycle and the next axis in the next half of the cycle. Pretty cute idea, right? If you can make it work. <laughs> if, you're, uh, if your clock cycle is long enough. Okay, so there are a bunch of readings, but I'm not, not, not all of these are required. This is only if you're interested. Well, this is required. I would recommend this one pager that's really coined the term memory level parallelism. It's by Andy Glue. Uh, it's in the wild and crazy idea session. It's a one page document uh, that talks about why MLP, memory level parallelism, is much more important than instruction level parallelism from his perspective. Uh, and some of these cover the memory level parallelism. We're going to talk about some of these uh, later on. Okay, let's jump to the main memory system. So well, I'll give you some more readings. Again, these, this is not required. I'll talk about the required ones. This is recommended. This is a long reading that talks about the state of the art in main memory circa 2015. There's a shorter version, but that's even older. So I, wouldn't re I would recommend the longer one. Uh, so we're going to look at DRAM quite a bit. And uh, there's no real good book that talks about this, in my opinion, at least. But you can look at some of the articles that we have published. And I'll, I'll give you some particular sections of, of some of the uh, work. So if you really want to quickly understand how DRAM operates internally, I'd recommend sections one and two of this paper, Tiered Latency DRAM, which we may cover at some point and sections one and two of this uh, paper, a case for sub area level parallelism in DRAM, which we may also cover at some point. And we've also, this is one of your potential required readings. So if you read section one and two of this paper, the Raider paper, you have a good idea of the refresh problem anyway. Okay, and also we'll talk about simulation and you'll do some simulation in later labs. Uh, so it's uh, one of the questions we always have in system design is how do you evaluate future systems or main memory systems? So this is uh, a reading about an open source simulator and its brief description that's actually widely used by uh, both industry and academia at this point. And we may use it in some of the, uh, uh, some of the uh, assignments here, but regardless of whether or not we may use it, you're gonna build a simulator that is kind of similar, but, it, but probably simpler. But you can read this four page paper also to get an idea of the DRAM landscape. And I'm gonna reference it later on as well. But, let, but I would like to first give you a broad overview of the main memory system to uh, give you uh, the problems. Because since we started this course with memory, right? Caches are such a fundamental part, and they actually play into this also. Uh, but main memory is an even more important part uh, right now uh, in, in, uh, in systems. And I'll give you uh, the perspective from four, four different ways. The first perspective is the performance perspective. Uh, I th actually, I've given you one of the perspectives, the security perspective earlier, right? With the row hammer problem, I'm going to come back to that. But one of the reasons main memory is important is it's really a limiter of performance. <laughs> so this is uh, something that was said by Dick Seitz. Dick Seitz is actually the original alpha architect. So alpha architecture, uh, to give you a little bit of history, I talk about alpha. Now let me give you the history. So uh, there, there was this architecture called VAX, virtual address extensions. Uh, from Digital Equipment Corporation. That was one of the dominant architectures for late 1970s, 80s, 90s, dot, dot, dot. And that was a very complicated architecture and digital equipment actually built a lot of machines that uh, was some of the fastest machines of the world. And then at some point they said, oh, we're gonna scrap this architecture. We're gonna come up with something clean. And Alpha was the clean architecture that they designed. And it was actually a very clean architecture. It doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately because of various issues, which we can discuss over some other thing, not lecture. Uh, but that architecture uh, was designed, uh, Dick Seitz was actually one of the primary architects of it. He, he wrote the manuals of it. By the way, he's going to come and give a distinguished lecture in the CS department some, sometime in October or November, so I would definitely recommend that you attend that. He's not going to talk about this, I think. <laughs> but <laughs> he's going to talk about data centers, I believe. Uh, but doesn't matter. Uh, so the alpha architecture, uh, they designed, they designed some of the flagship processors, the ones that I mentioned, 21064, 164, 264. 264 was the out-of-order execution superscalar engine. And it was designed to be a four-wide issue engine. Four-wide meaning it can, it can issue and execute four instructions. Fetch, issue, execute four instructions per cycle. So ideally, you want four instructions per cycle performance, right? So the sites figured out, they, oh, despite all of the techniques they've employed, the instructions per cycle they get out of the machine is one-fourth. Instead of four, they get one over four. So it's that 16, one, uh, one sixteenth the capability of the machine. And he figured out the reason is this. 
Most of the time, the machine is waiting for memory to deliver the data. <laughs> That's why he said it's the memory stupid. Now, he may not have been the first person who said this, but he is the first person who wrote about it that I could find on the internet. If I didn't do my homework perfectly, I could have searched all of the libraries of the world. <laughs> But again, okay, this is actually data from one of the papers that I recommended. This is uh, one of my earlier papers. Uh, other people have shown this data later as well as earlier as well. But basically, this is if you have a 128 entry window machine that can look at 128 instructions ahead of the current instruction, how much time does it spend on truly computation? And how much time does it spend stalling, waiting for stuff? So about 68% of the time, it waits, it's, st it's stalling. It's not doing forward progress, basically. It's waiting for something. And about 55% of the time, what it's waiting for is L2 cache misses, basically waiting for memory. Despite all of the stuff that we do, caching, prefetching, dot, 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 prefetching, we haven't talked about what we'll talk about, we're still bound by the L2 cache misses on memory-intensive workloads. If your workload fits in cache, there's no problem, of course, but these are more interesting workloads, in my opinion, that do not fit in cache. You have big data sets, uh, and you're analyzing data. You're doing stuff, basically, interesting things. So this is true for other people. I've shown it for databases. Actually, there is a, a nice paper in VLDB, I believe 1999, by Natasha Ailamaki, who, who's at EPFL right now, that looks at where do the cycles go in my database. And what they showed is something similar, basically. <laughs> And this was done with Intel, so we looked at a lot of Intel workloads, and if you want to look at the workloads, you can, you can actually look at the paper. Uh, but I'm not going to delve into that. Basically, that's the performance perspective. That's where we are in memory. And this is, this is still true, actually. Actually, Google recently published a paper in 2015 uh, where they analyzed all of their data center workloads, uh, and uh, they looked at microarchitectural analysis of that workload. Uh, we should put that paper online. Uh, and uh, what they found is something similar. <laughs> On a lot of the workloads, 40 to 50% of the time, maybe higher, is they're just waiting for memory. Okay, so the second perspective is an energy perspective. That's important also. This is uh, uh, from Bill Daly's keynote at High Peak in 2015. Uh, this is some old technology parameters, but that's okay. Things have not changed as much since then. Let's focus on the energy cost of doing different things in a node. So this is the energy cost of a 256-bit access to an 8-kilobyte SRAM, for example. It costs 50 picojoules. What about a 64-bit double-precision floating-point operation? It costs 20 picojoules, with some technology assumptions, of course, from, I mean, informed from NVIDIA and dot, dot, dot. If you look at a DRAM access, a memory access on the other end, it costs 19 nanojoules. That's almost three orders of magnitude. Right? So basically, a memory access consumes three orders of magnitude, the energy of a complex addition over here. And double precision floating point addition is one of the complex additions that you have. It's not the most complex operation that you implement, but it's one of the complex operations. Uh, so given this, uh, I think it's good to think about the balance of the system. Right? So if you, uh, if you rewind about 70 years ago, when von Neumann wrote uh, the classical paper on von Neumann architecture and tried to figure out what were the parameters like at that time, you would see that this was red and that was green at that time. <laughs> Meaning the cost of, a, at that point, there was no 64-bit double precision floating point operation, but the cost of a complex addition was much more expensive than the cost of a single memory access, about two orders of magnitude, let's say one to two orders of magnitude. That study is not easy to do, of course, right? People were less concerned with energy at that time. Today, energy is a critical design uh, concern. So that's another perspective. And I'll give you some more perspective about the energy uh, in a little bit from real studies that you may actually want to read. There's a third perspective, which is a reliability perspective. Uh, I don't think I've shown this in the lecture before, but basically reliability of memory is decreasing uh, because we're putting more cells in a given chip area. And we've discussed this previously before. But this is one study uh, that uh, one of my students did with Facebook. And basically what we've done is we've gone and analyzed every single memory error that in every single server that Facebook has. And they have a lot of servers. They may have the most servers actually in the world. I'm not sure. <laughs> That's a hard thing to say. But clearly 
it's, it's clear that they have so many servers that they don't let us publish the number of servers and the amount of memory because that affects their stock price somehow <laughs> because people keep speculating on that. But it doesn't matter. If you do that very large scale study and analyze all of those errors across a year or so in the servers, you find that the server failure rate is increased. Uh, uh, the server failure rate is positively correlated with the chip density of DRAM that's employed in the servers. And if you want to understand this metric, you really need to read the paper because there is a lot of normalization that goes into this metric. But basically, uh, reliability of memory is reducing and it's affecting the servers that we have in the field. Okay, and you've already seen the row hammer vulnerability from the previous lecture, right? How many of you remember that? Okay, we're going to delve a little bit more into that uh, today, but maybe not enough more. So clearly, there's a security perspective also. And this is always related, in my opinion. So if you have a reliability problem, if you don't fix it, if you expose it to the programmer somehow, you always have a security problem. You may not think that you have, you, you have a security problem, but you may not know what's going on also. OK, so we've seen this before. So there's a security problem also. OK, so the reliability and security perspective, I recommended this paper before, and this is very recent. So it's even more recent, but it's not as broad as the memory. It's more from the reliability and security perspective. So you can read this at your spare time. Okay, so let's hopefully motivate so, uh, some of the perspectives. I'll, I'll, I'll do some more motivation, so we'll stay at a higher level before we get into the fundamentals of DRAM a little bit more. Any questions so far? Is this interesting? Boring? No? You don't think memory is a problem? <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> memory, is not a, memory is a problem if you're actually uh, putting your system, running your system at the fastest possible speed. If memory is not a problem, then you're not utilizing your system very well. That's, what, that's always my argument in today's systems. <laughs> okay, so basically we're going to focus the next couple of lectures on main memory, and that is a critical component of all systems that we build today. And we're going to look at many issues like size, technology, efficiency, cost, and management algorithms. Again, I can reorder the lectures a little bit. My goal is to cover the fundamentals of uh, main memory and two lectures, hopefully. But if you look at processors and caches, FPGAs, GPUs, whatever substrate, it has this memory interface, and that memory interface is constant, and it's basically connected to DRAM today. And usually, if you're actually really well utilizing your system, your bottleneck is that interface. How much, how how, how much fast, how fast you can bring data through that interface. Actually, I had the perfect example of this just before coming to the lecture. You guys know Tannenbauer over here? There's a door over there that's revolving, right? <laughs> so that's the memory bottleneck for you. <laughs> if there are many people at the same time trying to get out or get in, or both at the same time, you'll see that that's a bottleneck. It takes a long time to get out or get in because that thing is so slow. It cannot accommodate multiple people at the same time. So that's very similar to the bottleneck that we have. Maybe I could replace that with the picture of the Tanem bar. <laughs> okay, so this is another view of the system. Uh, this is my pictorial view. I drew this in Xfig. How many of you use Xfig? Oh man, I'm too old. <laughs> Xfig is a drawing program that's uh, in Linux, uh, and it's nice because I can work. I can work with it. <laughs> I cannot work with. Uh, PowerPoint, da, da, da. But basically, uh, what, what this is showing over here is, uh, this is actually showing a system that we have not looked at before. One of the choices that we will have uh, in caches is sharing the caches or making them private to the cores. I briefly alluded to that. But another choice is, do you actually have a, a single uh, monolithic shared cache or a distributed shared cache? So what this is depicting is you have a distributed shared cache. And actually, it's like a banking, but it's a higher uh, abstraction level. You're really distributing uh, parts of the cache and partitioning them across uh, different cores. Okay, but that's not my point. That's, uh, that's something fast-forwarding. We'll talk about that. But if you look at a system today, most of the system is really dedicated for caches, interconnects, other caches, other interconnects, memory controllers, other interconnects, memory, other interconnects, and other memory. <laughs> Storage is a type of memory also. So basically, most of the system that we design today is dedicated to just storing and moving data. What we've covered in digital circuits, this core is a little part of the system today. In fact, most people know how to design this really well, 
but most people don't know how to manage the data really well. OK, so let me give you a, a broader perspective of the memory system. Basically, we'll talk about uh, some recent technology architecture and application trends that lead to some new requirements from the system and that exacerbate some old requirements. And as we've seen before in the caching memory hierarchy lecture, we always wanted a lot from the system, right? Zero latency, zero cost, infinite bandwidth, infinite capacity. But there are some new requirements also on top of this, or at, at least expanding requirements. So uh, hopefully I will give you some examples showing that DRAM uh, memory is important because DRAM and memory controllers, as we design them today, are unlikely to satisfy these requirements. And we're already experiencing some issues like row hammer, as we've discussed. And there are some emerging memory technologies that are non-volatile that enable new opportunities. So we'll talk about that today because this is becoming, it's already become a reality, actually. How many of you know about Intel's Optane system? Okay, some of you do. So that's basically, uh, I don't know what it is exactly, but it's, it's like a storage right now that's based on phase change memory, which is a new technology, at least an enabled technology. The goal is to, uh, at, at some point, that technology will replace DRAM or augment DRAM. But then there are a lot of trade-offs associated with it. So today, there's a possibility of some emerging memory technologies potentially replacing DRAM. And they're non-volatile, which means that they may actually replace both DRAM and flash, or they have some position in the hierarchy that, ch that uh, changes the hierarchy significantly. So you guys are at a good point in time where, when you're studying computer architecture because computer architecture, as I said, was not this exciting 20 years ago. Okay, so given this, people are actually rethinking the main memory system to fix issues that are happening with DRAM and enable some of these emerging technologies while satisfying all the requirements. Now let me give you the broad perspective of some of the trends. So these are some trends. There's an increasing need for main memory capacity, bandwidth, and quality of service, predictability, actually, because multiple things are sharing the memory system. I should have put latency over here, but I don't have enough space. So put that latency over there. Latency is always important. So why is this happening? Uh, there, uh, we're putting increasingly more cores and agents, accelerators, into the system. They're demanding more. Applications are becoming increasingly intensive. And you can see this everywhere, right? My favorite example is really genomics. Today we can actually sequence genomes so fast and so cheaply that we're really overwhelming the capabilities of the system, storing it and analyzing it. And we don't, we don't even have, uh, yeah, exactly, because of other reasons also. But it, uh, because the main reason is really da applications are data intensive, right? Uh, and we want to consolidate more and more. Consolidation is the idea of putting multiple applications on the same node, for example, or same substrate, hardware substrate. We want to do that more and more because if you put more things in the same node, you're more efficiently utilizing that node, both in terms of area, energy, cost, uh, and cooling power, right? People are, for example, uh, going to cloud computing, which you may have heard of, I assume. Uh, I don't know what it means, but for, for me, what it means is really you send many, many applications to a data center and data center execute them all at the same time. So that's one example of consolidation, right? Instead of having a dedicated data center doing a dedicated application like search, today it's not only doing search, but it's also doing many, many other people's applications at the same time. And if you want to utilize the system best, you actually want to consolidate not only at the data center level, but also at the rack level, but also at the uh, node level, and also at the processor level, right? All of those, you, you really want... Uh, everything share, uh, things to be consolidated. And this is happening in other systems also. For example, my cell phone is running many things at the same time, right? Okay, so let me give you some trends. So this is one trend. Uh, this is from an ISCA paper that was published in 2009 by HP Labs and University of Michigan. What they looked at is they basically plotted the core count and DRAM capacity, DIM capacity. We'll talk about what a DIM is later on. But basically, it's a DRAM module. We'll, we'll go and construct, uh, deconstruct what a DIM is later on. But basically, they've shown that the core count is doubling approximately every two years, and DRAM DIM capacity is doubling approximately every three years. Even though both trends are exponential, they're exponential, they're linear in this because this is really a logarithmic axis. Uh, but even though both trends are exponential, there is a difference in the exponents, and as a result, there is a gap. Basically, they've suggested that memory capacity per core is dropping by 30% every two years, which means that if your applications are not somehow scaling, or the scaling, fa uh, if, if your computation uh, data needs are scaling as fast as the number of cores, you have a problem, right? You're not sustaining the data. Uh, and also, uh, 
if memory capacity per core is dropping, that means that a single thread is getting less space. And how do you, uh, this, this puts a burden on the software designer because the software has traditionally relied on having more space uh, in memory to actually get more performance or more features or more whatever you want from software. So this is a problem. And as with any graph, you should always be critical, right? Maybe you can, uh, and that's one of the purposes of this course. It's good to be critical and say, oh, yeah, but what, is, what about after 2010, right? <laughs> well, this was published in 2009, so <laughs> you can forgive the authors for not having data points for over here. But you can always say, oh, maybe the core count is not increasing as fast. And you may be right, actually. Maybe the uh, general purpose cores are not increasing that fast, but we're putting many, many more accelerators in the system today. That heterogeneity is actually adding more pressure in terms of memory capacity. So if you look at the trends for memory bandwidth per core, they're actually much worse. Memory bandwidth is increasing by about 10% per year, which is sad. Uh, but there is a jump, as we will discuss later on. Uh, and if you're actually demand, demanding a lot of data, there's a problem here. So basically, the takeaway is we're just, we're, we know how to put more cores into the system, but we don't know how to supply data to it, both in terms of storage and the bandwidth. So basically, we're, in other words, we're putting more cores, we're starving them. <laughs> okay, let's, let's have some more fun <laughs> with these trends. Uh, so this is the DRAM uh, improvement, and this is the last 18 years. I've given you the capacity. So capacity actually is bad, right? But it's not the worst of the problems, as I've already said. But if you look at the capacity improvement over the last 18 years, it's not been that bad. It's exponential. And as you see, because of DRAM scaling issues, we're having some trouble right now. It's becoming a step function, if you draw it that way. So it's, about, it's improved significantly. What do you think about bandwidth over the last 18 years? Any guesses as to how much has it improved in the past 18 years? Bandwidth is transactions per second or bytes per second you can get out of DRAM. Nobody guess, guessing anything? Is it 100x? Zero? I want to guess. Six X. Okay. Well, it's not, it's not terrible. I guess it's not a bad guess. <laughs> but it's really 20 X. But it, it, if, as you can see over here, it's kind of tapering off also because of power limitations. So traditionally, bandwidth has been improved by uh, increasing the frequency of the memory bus. And that frequency is tapering off because of power limitations today. It's increasing still, but not, not as fast as you can see. But this is still not the worst of our problems, perhaps. What about latency? <laughs> Clearly, I've given you a bound now by saying it's not the worst of our problems. <laughs> but it has to be less than 20x. Yes? 1.3. You've seen this presentation, I think. <laughs> That's good, though. You, you, get, you get brownie points for remembering. <laughs> you could have remembered it as, I don't know, 3x. <laughs> That's possible also. Yeah, basically, latency has improved by only 1.3x, like 30% over the last 18 years. And in fact, some latency parameters have increased, and we may talk about that later on. So this is a problem, because latency is still important, and we're going to talk about that. This doesn't mean that... Uh, I mean, this actually shows something which is uh, uh, very interesting, I think. Latency requires more work to improve. It's actually a more expensive thing to get in almost everything. Whereas capacity is easier because we are really relying on the technology scaling to get the capacity. If we can fix the reliability issues, that's fine. That's why this has improved a lot. And bandwidth is also dependent on technology, and it's also an easier problem to solve. As we've discussed, you can actually do tricks, right? But latency is a little bit harder. Uh, and also, one of the other reasons why this has been this way is DRAM has been very much driven by cost. If you want to reduce cost, reducing latency goes against the reducing cost goal. Whereas capacity, if you increase cost per bit, uh, so if you increase uh, the amount of bits that you can store for a given area, that reduces your cost. Okay, we'll talk about that. But I mean, before we talk about that, uh, I think it's good to keep in perspective some of the applications that are really important. DRAM latency is actually still critical for performance. Other things are also critical. For example, in-memory databases have been enabled because of that huge capacity increase. But... Now they may be limited by some of the latency because the transactions are not as fast. And there are some nice papers that are referenced over here that you, may, you can look at that talk about uh, the latency issues. Graph processing, 
which is employed in almost all big uh, data, uh, data intensive workloads, uh, in-memory data analytics, and the data center workloads, they're all limited by latency. In fact, this is a paper that I referenced uh, from Google in ISCA 2015 that talks about memory latency being a big problem. Okay. Okay, we'll, not, we'll talk about latency later on. Yes? Well, it's because it's really the interconnect is not really scaling very well. The interconnect latency is not reducing well. That's one of the issues. But it's also a conscious choice made by the DRAM manufacturers. They're using the extra transistor they get for capacity and not for latency. So there are multiple reasons. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that later on. So if you're interested, this tiered latency DRAM paper that I talked about earlier gives you a very good perspective of the capacity latency trade-off. But we will get to that as well. Okay, let's talk about energy and power as well. We briefly looked into it, but let me give you the system perspective. So this was a paper written by IBM uh, in 2003, where they showed in their big iron servers, uh, big data center servers, about 40 to 50% of the energy is spent on the off-chip memory hierarchy. Now fast forward, 2010, another IBM paper in Power 8, they show that about 40%, more than 40% of the power in DRAM is in DRAM. In a GPU, more than 40% of the power is in DRAM. So when they did the study in 2003, actually, off-chip memory hierarchy was not just DRAM, but also off-chip caches, off-chip interconnect, off-chip storage, dot, dot, dot. But now DRAM is consuming, actually, comparatively more power today. And we've already seen that DRAM consumes power even when it's not used. Periodic refresh, that's a problem. Okay, on top of this, DRAM technology scaling is ending. Uh, I'll, I'll come to a nice point, and then we'll uh, take a break. Uh, but basically, uh, people have been thinking that DRAM is not going to scale easily below some size. As you reduce the size of the circuit, it becomes much less reliable. As a result, ITRS is an international technology roadmap of semiconductors. They've been doing projections on future technology for years and years. They renamed themselves to something else that I don't remember at the moment. But they've been projecting that DRAM will not scale beyond of technology in node. Uh, and scaling, reducing the size of the DRAM circuit has provided many benefits as we've seen, like capacity being the most important part, but lowering the cost and reasonable energy, lower energy scaling. So if this ends, then there's a problem. And this already ending, actually. Uh, there's increasing, row hammer is a problem that we will discuss a little bit more, but there are other problems in DRAM, which is increasing cell leakage current, refresh, reduced reliability, increasing manufacturing difficulties. And there are a bunch of papers that talk about it. So it's difficult to significantly improve capacity and energy with the same technology. On top of this, there are some emerging memory technologies that are promising, which are going to happen in this table, be, be covered. So there's 3D stack DRAM. DRAM is also changing because people are seeing that there's a problem that we're having with DRAM. So they're experimenting with things like 3D stack DRAM. This already exists, actually. You can buy it in GPUs. Uh, it provides you higher bandwidth. The idea is you have a logic layer underneath the memory layers and the memory layer and logic layer are connected with very fast, very high bandwidth through silicon vias. Basically, wires that are specially designed to cut across different dyes. <laughs> now, that's an engineering challenge to actually design this, but people have designed this. It comes at a higher cost, uh, but it gives you higher bandwidth. There's a reduced latency DRAM, which we briefly talked about tier tiered latency DRAM, for example, as an example. It gives you lower latency. Low power DRAM is actually these things employ low-power DRAM. Actually, this employs low-power DRAM also. It doesn't employ the high-power DRAM that you have in servers. It gives you lower power. And we will talk about emerging technologies in a lecture. Uh, and this gives you larger, much, much larger capacity, actually, uh, hopefully. <laughs> and Intel's thing is called 3D X-Point, actually. It's, I think that's Optane is the name of the chip. But, of, of course, there's always downsides, right? This comes at smaller capacity. This comes at higher costs. This comes at higher latency and higher cost. And this comes at potentially many, many other higher things. <laughs> but the key thing is how do you actually take advantage of the greens while avoiding the reds as much as possible? OK. I think this may be a good place for us to take a break. Let's do a six-minute break to, right now. <laughs> I'm randomly picking the <laughs> number of breaks. but number. All right. I think our six minutes are up, right? I didn't keep time, but 
at least we had some margin. Okay, so if you have any questions, we have a microphone here. So we should pass around the microphone so that at least the questions get recorded. Then you can, other people who watch it later can get the questions as well. So you're, you're the runner. <laughs> okay, so I think if you look at this picture, I think this is really exciting actually because if you f uh, rewind again five years, maybe ten years, you wouldn't see any of this almost, at least in the market. But a lot of these are in the market today, even the NVM. But we'll get to that. Okay, so let's talk about what are the, uh, some of the issues. Like, why, why, is it, uh, why is DRAM becoming much harder to scale? And the real problem is this charge. The memory that we have today in DRAM is charge-based. In DRAM, basically, we store a charge in the capacitor, and this charge escapes. In flash memory, which we're, we may talk about later on, you, you trap the charge in this, what is called the floating gate, and this charge also escapes, actually. Uh, DRAM needs refresh, right? Flash memory is non-volatile, right? You guys know that. Does it need refresh? How many people think that it needs refresh? Yes? No? Okay. There are some staunch no's. Well, it turns out it does need refresh also. <laughs> As we scale the technology, one of the reasons why this uh, breaks down uh, is that charge gets lost over time. So if you've written a lot into the flash memory, the retention capability of the cell degrades over time. So if you look at this flash memory specification, for example, it can say you can write to a cell at most 3,000 times. That's actually true. You can write to a cell at most 3,000 times, and after that it's not guaranteed that your write will be stored. Now the problem is as flash memory ages, as you keep writing to it, as you keep writing to a cell, you actually cause some problems in the floating gate, which I'm not going to go into detail about, but we can talk about if we talk about flash memory. And it turns out charge storage becomes harder, and if you start refreshing it, you can write more to flash memory. So in at least enterprise-scale enterprise SSDs, SSDs that are employed in data centers, today people are refreshing flash memory so that they can get much longer lifetime out of it, so that they can store data for longer. So basically, it's very fundamental to charge-based memories. This was not a problem in the past, 10 years ago, for example. They were not refreshing it because things were still large and you had a lot of charge storage and this was not as big of a problem. But now th people have reduced the size of this to very, very small nodes, uh, sm small sizes. As a result, you have very little charge in the gate and that escapes easily. And that's one of the problems. The other problem is reliable sensing also becomes difficult. Retention is difficult, but reliable sensing is also difficult as the storage unit size reduces. And we've seen this with DRAM, with Robhammer. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that today. But similar issues exist in flash memory also. When you read from one location, you disturb the other location. When you write to one location, you disturb the other location, as well as this location. So there are a lot of issues that happen with charge. Now, the emerging technologies, which we may get to later on, not, not in this lecture, but we will definitely get sometime in later lecture, they're fundamentally different because uh, the charge storage, uh, the storage is not dependent on the charge. It's dependent on the resistance. So whether you have high resistance or low resistance denotes whether you have a zero or one. And that's more scalable. Okay, so let's look at DRAM. So basically... Uh, any memory requires a storage device and an access device, as we discussed in the past, and this must be large enough for reliable sensing, and this must be, access device must be large enough for low leakage and high retention time in uh, DRAM. There's also other parts of the access device, bit line, sense amplifier, as we've discussed, right, when we talked about the DRAM earlier in memory hierarchy lecture, lecture two. Now, if you reduce the size of the circuit, both of these properties become difficult to maintain in, in case of DRAM. And this was the value that was assigned to X earlier in my slide by ITRS in 2009. In 2009, they said scaling the size of the circuit below 35 nanometers feature size is challenging. What do you guys think uh, the feature size of an existing DRAM chip is, a DRAM cell, today? 35? It's, it's the dimension of the DRAM cell. Today, we're actually much less than 35. 18. I think she's heard this lecture before. 
So 18 is actually where we are around today, actually. Um, that's, uh, I mean, where we will be is much lower than that, hopefully. But clearly, we are at 18, but people have been projecting that this is going to be challenging to reduce the size of the circuit because of reliability issues. And we know that, uh, I mean, I've already shown you the picture, the reliability has become a problem in DRAM. And this is a paper you might want to take a look at if you want to see that study, but that's not required again. Uh, so actually, people, including us, have been studying DRAM quite a bit. Uh, I think we were the first ones to build an infrastructure like this. These are basically FPGAs that are connected to a heater as well as a PC and a temperature controller where you can study different effects on DRAM, do the testing, basically. And if you really want to do uh, something like this, it's not part of this course, but uh, you can certainly uh, look at this paper and look at our infrastructure uh, where you I can get an FPGA and download this code and test any DRAM chip that you can get your hands on and that you can put on that bo FPGA board that you have. And what this does is basically at, uh, at the C++ level, you can actually send commands to DRAM and test the DRAM. For example, you can say disable refresh for this amount of time and then read the data, see if the data matches what I've written to earlier. That way you can do a lot of different tests. So, uh, one of the advantages of building such infrastructure, you can study all of these scaling issues in real DRAM chips. So whenever you are actually looking at a problem in DRAM, for example, how do you study it is, of course, a good question, right? How do you really understand what's going on in the DRAM chips? The best way is really taking the real chips and testing them and understanding the issues. So, uh, and this is the infrastructure that you may want to look at again. Uh, but basically, uh, while my students were testing these chips, one of the things that they've discovered, based on our experience on flash memory, actually, because we knew that there was a lot of read-disturb effects in flash memory, is uh, that you can actually do read-disturbance in DRAM also. You can predictably induce memory errors in most DRAM memory chips. And you know this problem. This is the rope hammer problem. I'm going to go through this relatively quickly because you've seen it. Uh, but it's, this is an example of the problem that we're having with memory, basically. We're having so many problems that, with the reliability that it's, they're already causing system security vulnerabilities. And I've shown you this picture before. Basically, the problem is uh, you need to access a row if you want to access a byte in memory. And for that, you need to activate the row. We're going to see this uh, more uh, later, uh, either today or in the next lecture. So you activate the row, which basically enables the word line. Um, and that, that happens by applying high voltage to that word line. Now, if you want to access some other row in this bank, you basically close the word line. This is called pre-charge. You prepare the array for the next access right? by applying low voltage over here and do some other stuff to prepare the array, to prepare the bit line such that they can sense the next access. Now, this is called activate pre-charge. That's what you need for a read, actually. Usually, you do activate, read, pre-charge, activate, read, pre-charge. Now, if you're actually going through the row buffer, you do activate, read, 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 read and then pre-charge, right? Now, if you don't do the read, but if you actually do this, activate pre-charge, activate pre-charge, activate pre-charge, activate pre-charge, activate pre-charge, over and over, enough times, before the cells get refreshed, within a refresh interval, this is what happens. Actually, even if you do the read, it doesn't matter. I'm going to show you that, but this is for the pictorial purposes. What happens in many DRAM chips today is that adjacent rows get bit flips. A, zero, a cell was charged over here, it gets discharged after you do this hammering, what's called hammering. And we call this the hammer draw. These are the victim rows. They're physically adjacent. You, you're going to read the paper, assuming you choose uh, that as one of your papers. Uh, but this is happening today because cells are just too close to each other. These cells in this hammer draw are so close to each other that they're affecting the victim rows. In fact, if you look at a DRAM chip today, it's it's so dense that these cells are really not linear almost. They're, they're almost like hexagonal. They're inter intertwined with each other almost, which is really interesting. And in fact, uh, the other picture that I showed you earlier is not uh, real from a physical perspective. The capacitor looks like this, right? In a real DRAM chip, capacitor looks like this. Basically, it's etched 3D. And the, the aspect ratio and the access transistor is on top. And the aspect ratio of this capacitor is about 50 to 90x the size of that transistor. So that, you, because you want to make the capacitor as little as possible so that you can put a lot of capacitors. So how do you make, make it little as possible? You go vertical. If you go vertical, you need to store enough charge 
How do you need how do you store enough charge? Well, you deep deep down and dig, dig down deeper, right? That's the idea. So that's how these things get, uh, these are actually really interesting engineering uh, problems that people have solved. But the problem is, regardless of, uh, once you do that, you're, you lose a lot of isolation across the cells. And whenever you, uh, so one of the reasons for a row hammer, as you will read in the paper, is uh, whenever you activate this row, it turns out these two uh, word lines are coupled uh, when you activate this with a high voltage, you're also applying a little voltage inadvertently to this word line. Now, if you apply a little voltage to this word line, it's getting, the capacitors are getting connected, and there are some cells that are vulnerable to this row hammer effect, and they're leaking charge little. And then if you apply this high voltage again, they're leaking charge again. If you apply this high voltage again, they're leaking charge again. And if you do it enough times before the memory gets refreshed, you may actually lose the charge in some vulnerable cells because they just get depleted, right? That's the idea. That's one of the reasons why this is happening. You don't have enough isolation, and you have word line to word line coupling between the cells. Okay, and we've tested a bunch of chips, and you can see that more than 80% of the chips that are tested from different manufacturers are vulnerable to this effect. Do you want to give the microphone to him? <laughs> That's a little bit... <laughs> yeah, latency overhead for sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, just my question is that uh, you said there's a bit flip. Does it mean that like uh, if there was a zero, it can become one, or only one becomes zero? Because the thing that you described currently is yeah, yeah. leaks, leaks. So basically, it leaks means that it has something, and then it becomes zero. Mm -hmm. So that part, that's how we interpreted the, the. So okay, uh, let me let me handle that. You, sh you should read the paper if you're interested. The paper actually shows that, but uh, zero doesn't mean discharged. So basically, the leakage happens from charged to discharged. But you may encode the charge bit as zero or one. But it's always um, one direction. It's, it's always one direction, yeah. Leakage goes one direction. That's correct, yes. Now, there are some very, very small cases where it may go the other direction, but we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> Intuitively, it goes one direction. But once you actually go into this small scale, it turns out there are so many weird things that happen in the circuit. I call this quantum-like effects. That there, it's not, you cannot guarantee that it's only in one direction. There are some cases when you test the devices, sometimes you actually gain charge, which is really interesting. It does happen <laughs> because there's some noise in the sense amplifier, and that actually can get into the cell. Anyway, that's one of the potential reasons. But that's what makes it really exciting also, because really, you're, you're really trying to understand what's going on. You, people have built the system, but you don't even understand it necessarily at some level. Right. Okay. Uh, but, but for most cases, it's the leak charge yeah, for, for an overwhelming majority of the bits. Okay, so this is a scaling problem because, as I showed you in, uh, uh, in an earlier lecture, in the past, this didn't happen. Cells were far away from each other. They had enough isolation. But after 2010, they started getting much closer to each other that this, become, this started becoming an issue. And all of the memory modules that we've tested between 2012 and 2013 were actually vulnerable to this effect, independent of the manufacturers, as you can see, right? We shall remain lameless. Okay, so uh, this is actually a bigger problem because it's not just activate and pre-charge, but you can induce these effects with user-level code that looks like this. You can basically download this code and execute it on your system. And what this code does is, basically, it, you, you need to do this hammering inside a memory bank, right? To be able to do that, you need to bypass the caches. That's what these cache flushes are all, all, all about. You need to avoid cache hits so that by, by flushing X from the cache, and you need to avoid row hits to X by actually reading Y in another row. Okay. Remember, there's a row buffer. You need to bypass. The row buffer is essentially another cache, right, at that level. So you need to bypass all the caches to induce this effect. That's why you have these cache line flushes and also uh, reading another row. So what this program does is it selects address X and Y such that they map to the same bank, which is another issue, right? How do you know which bank things map to? You need to do some reverse engineering. And it ping-pongs access to X and Y, and if the chip is vulnerable, it causes some bit flips. You can download it and test it, actually. It's fun. <laughs> okay, so this happens in real systems using that code. Uh, you can see that you get errors. If the DRAM chip is vulnerable, if the memory controller is fast enough for accessing the DRAM chip enough times before the cells get refreshed, remember refresh is every 64 milliseconds in today's chips, 
Uh, and it turns out that's true for these systems that we've tested. You get errors. Right. And errors are, of course, not proportional to the access rate because there's some, num some threshold number of accesses that you need to do to actually uh, generate these errors. And after that point, you may get a lot of errors. Okay. And as we've seen, this is a real reliability and security issue, right? This is the paper that you may read, one of the, one of the three. Uh, and uh, memory isolation is a key property of a reliable and secure computing system, and access to one memory address should, should not have unintended side effects on data stored in other addresses. That's the first sentence of the paper. And when we wrote the paper, we said that you could actually design an attack to take over a system. And that was obvious to us. <laughs> but while we were working on it, Google actually did that attack. This is Google Project Zero. This, I would recommend their blog post also if you're interested in system security. Uh, what they did was they exploited this uh, the row hammer mechanism, failure mechanism, they call it the bug. I like thinking about it as a failure mechanism. It's really a read disturbance. When you're doing a read, you're disturbing other cells. And they basically published what I copied over here, part of, part of which what I copied over here. They tested a selection of laptops, and they found a subset of them were vulnerable to this problem. And they, work, uh, they built two working privilege escalation exploits to, that use this effect. One of them takes over the Google native client, which is not that interesting in my opinion although it's interesting for Google, of course. It's their virtual machine, in a sense. But the other is much more interesting. Basically, you can actually, at the user level, first of all, what they did was they actually took our test and developed it to be further, such that they could hammer a row from both sides. So if you actually have a row over here, and if you're hammering uh, the physically adjacent one at the bottom and the physically adjacent one at the top, you can get more errors. So they were smart. <laughs> and they were able to induce these bit flips to gain kernel privileges when you run their program uh, as a user land process. And what they did was they were able to induce bit flips in the page table and the entry of a program. And once you actually gain right access to your own page table, which is essentially what they did, this is exactly their words from their blog post, actually. It's copy and paste. Uh, they were able to gain right access to the own page table of the user level process and gain read write access to all of physical memory. And once at that point, if you know the structure of the operating system, if you know what's in memory, you, you actually have everything that you need to do whatever you want in the system, right? Okay, and we've seen this before. I think I like this analogy the most, as I mentioned earlier, right? It's like uh, if you want to gain access to, I don't know, to that door somehow, you keep banging on this door, and then the perturbations that you cause because of that banging magically opens up that door, right? Which shouldn't happen, right? Okay, so later people showed that uh, these are just potential recommendations uh, for you if you're interested in this area, for example, in sec system security, and especially the hardware-related security issues. Uh, these folks from TU Grass showed that you can actually uh, induce these attacks using JavaScript on a remote server and take over that remote server. And these folks showed that you could actually take over an Android-based system, as we've discussed. This is actually a very nice paper that talks about how to do that. Okay, and this is one of your readings, as you see. So uh, there is a lot more analysis, of course, in the reading. You can take a look at it. But let's take a look at some of the solutions to the problem, which we haven't talked about before. Uh, so how do you solve the problem? As I said earlier, one solution could be increasing the refresh rate. Right? And this paper actually covers many more solutions, so you should look at that paper for more detail. But I'll talk about increasing the refresh rate. That's one thing that you can do in systems that are outside today. So if you have a vulnerable system today, one solution is really changing the refresh rate, increasing it. It's not clear if it will actually solve the problem because as uh, our paper shows, you need to increase the refresh rate by 7x to get rid of every single error. Uh, but that was the solution that was adopted by many, many manufacturers. This is Apple's security patch uh, where they acknowledge row hammer and they say this leads to memory corruption and they say this issue was mitigated by increasing memory refresh rates. Well, memory refresh rate, of course, reduces the vulnerability because you cannot do as many hammerings before the cells get refreshed, right? Uh, and these guys were nice because they cited our paper. <laughs> uh, and there were other, also other people also who, who released similar patches. And this, this works if you cannot patch your memory controller, right? This actually has a lesson uh, right now. If, you, if you're able to patch your memory controller with a software patch, you can potentially do this. If, you, if you're able to change your refresh rate. Maybe double your refresh rate. They don't tell by how much they change the refresh rate also. Right? Uh, so this may actually get you thinking, oh, if you have a much more flexible memory controller, maybe we can do even more, right? While the system is running in the field, if we find some other bugs, we can patch things. 
if you have a reliability lecture, we can talk about that also. But modern processors provide limited patchability in the system. So you can patch the microcode, for example. If an instruction is not executing correctly, you can change the microcode a little bit. Uh, but it's, it's very limited. It's true for this case also. It's very limited. But luckily, this is one solution. The question is, is this a good solution? <laughs> You're increasing your memory refresh rate, right? And we've discussed earlier that memory refresh is already a problem, right? It consumes power. It leads to performance issues. It leads to quality of service issues. So we don't want to do that necessarily. But this may be the only thing that you have you can do on existing systems in the field. So I'd encourage you to think about other solutions potentially. Error correcting code is another one. But if you already don't have an error correcting code here, what do you, what do, you do? Actually, most systems don't have error correcting codes. This, this laptop, for example, its memory doesn't have error correcting codes. Not today, at least. This doesn't have error correcting codes. Data centers, sure, they have error correcting codes. But if you read our paper, you'll also see that sing, simple error correcting code is not enough to get rid of all of the errors. You can actually get four-bit errors in a 64-bit uh, data burst, which is beyond the correction capability of existing error correcting codes that are employed in modern DRAM. OK, so we should probably have a reliability lecture that's more general uh, later on. OK, so let's talk about the solution. If you're reading the paper, you'll see the solution. But I'd like to highlight this because whenever you have problems, it's always more efficient to have solutions that are targeted for the problem. You can say refresh is a solution, but that's a very broad thing that affects a lot of other things. Ideally, you would like to solve the problem without affecting other things, right? Or while affecting other things as minimally as possible. ECC is another solution. Let's say you have a stronger ECC code that can correct, but that affects a lot of other things also, right? Because that's error correcting code is actually expensive, right? Because you need a separate, in today's, in to, today you need to have separate DRAM chips to store the error correcting codes. So, what is the potential solution? The solution idea in this paper is basically very simple. When you activate a row, basically after, after you close a row, after you pre-charge a row, uh, you activate one of its neighbors with a very low probability. And you can make that probability programmable to change your tolerance, for example, uh, to change your uh, reliability guarantee. So with probability five out of a thousand times, so five out of a thousand times, you, uh, when you close some row, uh, you probabilistically activate the adjacent neighboring rows. If you do that, you get a very good reliability guarantee. Why does this work? Because to be, to be able to hammer, you need to have enough number of accesses to a row. And if your probability is set nicely, you'll refresh before those number of accesses happen. Right? You don't refresh across the board. You don't refresh all of the RAM. You just refresh the adjacent rows. So that's the idea. And by adjusting the value of this probability, you can vary the strength of protection against errors. And you can. Some of you are reading the paper. You can see that the performance analysis is very favorable. You still get a slowdown even with these refreshes, but not as much as increasing the refresh rate across the board. And the other nice thing is this is stateless. It's low cost, low complexity. You don't need to track anything in the system other than figuring out when to generate these additional refreshes. OK. So how do you actually uh, implement this? So even a solution like this is not implementable today, actually. You need to change something in the system. You can change something in the DRAM chip, or you can change something in the DRAM controller, memory controller, as the paper discusses, the paper you're reading discusses. Let's talk about the DRAM chip first. Uh, so the idea is whenever you do an access, you want to activate an adjacent row. How do you do that without disturbing anything else in the system? Uh, one idea is potentially doing this when you're refreshing, right? When you're refreshing, you're actually refreshing some more rows. Uh, some other rows that you recently accessed. Or uh, after, you've ac act after you've closed the row, you actually refresh that row. So if there's enough timing slack in the parameters, uh, enough slack in the timing parameters, you can do that. Now, if you, to be able to understand this, you need to understand how DRAM works. Basically, today, uh, whenever you say, I activate DRAM, the memory, there's a protocol between the memory control and the DRAM that says uh, that's synchronous. There's a latency that's specified. You send an activate from the memory control DRAM, and the memory DRAM doesn't say, I'm done with the activate. It just doesn't say anything, actually. The memory control assumes that that activate is done after, I don't know, 35 nanoseconds, let's say. There's a timing parameter associated with it. So all of that protocol is synchronous, which is actually a problematic protocol also, which we will talk about later on. But it's very synchronous. So what Manufacturers today do is add a lot of slack to those parameters so that they can optimize a lot of things. So even though the data may be ready, 
much earlier, the memory controller still needs to wait. <laughs> and these parameters are actually designed for worst case conditions. 85 degrees operation, 85 degrees Celsius operation, for example, at the worst case temperatures. So that's why they're, uh, they have a lot of slack at um, reasonable operating conditions. Does that make sense? So it's a very synchronous protocol. Uh, it turns out there's a lot of slack in those parameters, just like the refresh that we've seen, right? You don't need to refresh every 64 milliseconds. You can refresh every second some cells still can retain data, as long as you know what to refresh. So similarly with the same timing parameters, you don't really need to wait for, I don't know, for 35 nanoseconds. You can actually wait for 5 nanoseconds, let's say. I'm just exaggerating. And all of the rest of the time is useless wait today. <laughs> That's what these papers actually show with real DRAM chips. So if you have this slack, what you can do is when you pre-charge an array, perhaps you can quickly activate the adjacent rows inside the DRAM chip and get rid of the row hammer problem, <laughs> maybe. That's a possibility, right? That's a possible solution in DRAM chip. I believe some of this is implemented by manufacturers today so that they can get rid of the row hammer, but it's not clear how they can scale that into the future. The other solution is putting some of the tasks to the memory controller. Basically, memory controller refreshes the adjacent rows. After it sends a pre-charge command, it's, it says, oh, I'm going to activate these adjacent rows also with very little probability. Now, the problem here is Memory controller today doesn't have enough information about DRAM. <laughs> we'll talk about that again later on, but uh, the memory controller doesn't know exactly which rows are adjacent to each other, physically adjacent to each other in DRAM. Why? Because DRAM internal remaps the addresses. Now, it turns out most of the rows, are, uh, most of the rows that are linearly adjacent in the physical address space are adjacent in the physical chip also, but there's some remapping that happens internally in DRAM. And why does this happen? Because of reliability issues, actually. It turns out what uh, DRAM manufacturers, af after they test the chip, they figure out a row is not working well. So internally, they have some address mapping logic that changes the address of that row to some, uh, that redirects that row to some other row inside DRAM. So that row gets remapped somewhere else, physically, in the chip. So the memory controller doesn't have enough information about the physical adjacency of addresses in DRAM. And that is a problem. That's why this cannot be done in the memory controller today. So you need to give that information. Memory controller should know how the data, how the addresses are mapped to different rows in DRAM, right? That's what you need to know to figure out what, uh, what to refresh. And if you know that, then this is possible. Okay, any questions? I've gotten into some depth over here, so hopefully I don't lose many people. But if you read the paper, a lot of this will become much, much more clear. Okay, so let me pull back a little bit because this solution I think is very, very interesting and important and people should employ more of it. And it's not just we have been talking about this, but some industry folks are also writing papers about it too. So first of all, they're writing papers about the seriousness of the problem. And this is a beautiful paper that was written by two, two companies that, that never, pay, never write papers together. This is the first time I've seen their written papers. <laughs> they wrote this in, in a forum where we invited papers in the memory forum, Samsung and Intel. They don't even talk to each other. It's not clear. <laughs> but they did uh, find it important to write this paper uh, where they talked about DRAM process scaling challenges. As you can see, this is directly from their slides. Uh, refresh, variable retention time, which we may talk about uh, more and the write latency increasing uh, problems. But it doesn't matter, you can read the paper, it's a four page paper. But the solution they proposed is to have an intelligent controller and co-architect it with DRAM so that you can solve some of these issues. Very similar to what I just discussed, right? The memory controller knows the address mapping inside the DRAM such that it knows what to refresh. Uh, basically today, uh, solving these issues just by scaling the process is difficult. Just in the DRAM is difficult. You really need an intelligent controller that's covering up some of these issues, solving these issues. And row hammer is just one problem, right? There might be other reliability issues, like refresh. For example, if you have an intelligent controller that can do bloom filters, just like we've discussed Raider, and do the refresh based on those binning of the rows, well, that can actually enable your process scaling much better because perhaps you don't, you're not bound by the refresh rate for all of the cells, right? Many cells you can refresh at much higher, uh, much lower rates. 
Okay, so I would recommend this paper also, actually. This will be on their reading list. And as you know, I recommended this paper. This also covers a lot of issues and uh, talks about that paper, too. Okay, so let me... Uh, we're we're, we're going to transition back, but let's, uh, let's talk about the Flash a little bit also. And we may actually dedicate a lecture also. Similar issues happen in Flash, as I said. In fact, Grovehammer was inspired by the fact that we knew Flash was vulnerable to read disturb effects. And this is another uh, infrastructure that we've built. This is, again, an FPGA-based testing infrastructure for NAND Flash chips. And this is actually a really old one right now. Uh, and there are a bunch of issues, like program interference, read disturb errors, as you can see. Uh, and there are a bunch of vulnerabilities in Flash. But I'm not going to talk about that right now. Just to, uh, but you can take a look at this paper if you're really interested. This is the state-of-the-art uh, survey on how errors happen, how they're mitigated, and how they're potentially recovered from in today's solid-state drives. Uh, but at some point, we may actually have a Flash memory lecture. But this is just to give you the idea that these issues exist in Flash also, and they also pose vulnerabilities. So one of the big issues, I think, in memory today, aside from everything else we've discussed, uh, latency, dot, 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 uh, uh, bandwidth. Uh, remember, I started with performance. But we're also now having fundamental security, reliability, and safety threatened because of these lower-level problems. So it's important to uh, consider these in architectures also, and people are already considering it. Okay, I've given you a broad stroke. Let me give you one more broad stroke, and then we're going to jump into more, uh, more fundamentals again. So, oh, well, these are fundamental. Don't, don't get me wrong. These are really fundamental. These fundamental things are affecting everything on top, but I want to give a more basic background on DRAM in a little bit. So how do we solve the memory problem in general? Uh, since we're having issues like this, I think there are three broad solution directions. One is fixing it, making memory and controllers more intelligent. That's what we've discussed, right, just now. Basically having new interfaces, new functions, and new architectures inside memory. I call this a system memory co-design, co-designing the system and the memory, or the controller and the memory together. And that's essentially what can enable you to solve problems, but this can enable new opportunities also. And if you have a 3D stack DRAM, as we've discussed earlier, if you have a logic layer underneath DRAM and very high bandwidth connection, and if you can put anything in that logic layer, a processor, let's say, then you can actually do something like this. You can have a different interface to that logic layer, you can tell that logic layer, logic layer, execute this function for me, right? You can have a field programmable gate array inside, inside that logic layer. So we're going to talk about that in later lectures. But that logic layer can also do row hammer protection, can also do error correction, can also do many, many things. So uh, new, uh, new things can open up because of the uh, problems that we have in memory. The second solution direction, which we're also going to cover later in lectures, is eliminating or potentially minimizing the problem, if not eliminating it. If we can come up with some other technology that doesn't have these issues, wouldn't it be nice, right? And people actually sought that for a long time. Uh, and other people said good luck all the time. <laughs> this is always a tough problem, right, coming up with a new technology. But today we may actually have some technologies like phase change memory, MRAM, uh, magnetic memory, and memristors you may have heard of, which we will also talk about in a later lecture. But this can actually enable system-wide rethinking of how we actually design memory and storage. And the third solution direction I think is very interesting also, which is, at least from the uh, reliability perspective, maybe embracing the problem, right? <laughs> Saying, okay, we're not going to uh, produce really, really reliable memories at low cost. We can produce them at high cost, sure. But high cost is not uh, what enables progress really fast. If we cannot produce all of them to be low cost, why not produce most of them to be high, uh, low cost but unreliable, and some of it to be high cost and reliable, and put these things together and partition our data intelligently such that we can get the best of both worlds. Right. Unreliable memory gives you high capacity, low cost. Reliable memory gives you protection from all of these security and reliability issues. So I think this is a little bit, a little bit more far-fetched, but I think it's uh, very interesting to examine today. So this could lead to new models for data management and maybe usage. I'll give you one example of this. I mean, before I give you the example, if you look at all of these solutions, they require rethinking. They require uh, cooperation across the stack, right? Software, hardware, devices. Because the solution is not only at the device level. Clearly, we're having problems at the device level. Not at the architecture level only. Not at the technology level. Not at the software level. In fact, think about solving the row hammer problem only in software. How do you do that? Again, I'll say good luck to you. <laughs> it's tough, I think. It's maybe possible, I don't know. 
Uh, actually, there have been some papers related to it by examining the performance counters and trying to uh, figure out whether you're having a particular row based on the performance counters. But the overheads that you get into at that level become too high, in my opinion. They've shown low overheads, but it's not clear if that will work in, under all conditions in all systems. Okay, so you really need to think across the stack. Uh, okay, let me, I, I'm continuing the broad strokes over here just to uh, motivate the later parts. So what is this uh, first solution direction? I'm going to give you the uh, three sol solution directions again with a broad stroke. We want a more memory-centric system design. That's essentially what we're thinking of, right? Uh, if the controller is closer to memory, that's your, you're now more memory-centric. And this enables new memory architectures, new interface, and new functions. And if you look at the industry today, this is already slowly starting to happen. Again, five years ago, ten years ago, it was not this way. DDR4, well, at that point, it was DDR2, DDR3, was the main thing. But today we have a huge bifurcation, uh, a heterogeneity in the space of memory, as I showed you earlier. Right? Uh, and people are very open to new interface and new functions. And also better waste management. We haven't talked about this as much, but we're wasting a lot of memory today, if you think about it. So uh, there have been a lot of studies that showed that most of the memory stores zeros. You can actually do that study yourself, figure out how fraction, what fraction of your memory stores zeros. But there's a story from, uh, there's a paper from 2005, uh, Iska uh, Paris Stenstrom from Chalmers uh, and one of his students showed that 30% of the memory DRAM stores zeros. 30 is a lot, but our, our, our results actually show even higher. So how do you actually deal with that waste? Do you really want to store zeros in memory? Why not compress it or encode it in some different way, right? And people are looking into that. So there are a bunch of key issues to tackle. Hopefully, I've convinced you that enabling reliability at low cost is critical for high capacity. But reducing energy, reducing latency, improving bandwidth, reducing waste in terms of both capacity, bandwidth, and latency, and enabling computation close to data is important. And I'm, we're going to talk about various of these as the lecture progresses, but this one is important because this can actually change the paradigm, uh, von Neumann paradigm, as we've discussed. And this can also solve a lot of the issues at the same time, right? That way, you're less, uh, your latency is lower, your energy is lower, your bandwidth requirements may be lower, and maybe you can actually fix the reliability issues with computation close to data, just like we've discussed earlier, right? So if you can actually do computation close to data, you can actually solve some of these issues together. So we're going to talk more. And if you're interested, these are some of the papers that talk about <laughs> DRAM. So <laughs> I'm not ex expecting you guys to read all of them. <laughs> but that's just to give you a perspective. OK, so the second solution direction, let me give you the second direction. We're not going to talk about it in this lecture or maybe in a few lecture, even in a few lectures. But uh, as I said, there are some emerging memory technologies that are more scalable than DRAM. And they're more scalable because they're resistive. They encode data in terms of resistance levels. And on top of that, they're also non-volatile. DRAM is volatile, obviously, we're refreshing it. Flash is volatile. Uh, Flash is non-volatile, but we're refreshing it. <laughs> That's interesting also, right? Uh, actually, even though these memories are non-volatile, they also require refresh, but we'll talk about that when we get to it. <laughs> so refresh is not really uh, something that you can get away with, in my opinion. In my opinion, memory is very fundamental. At some point, you'll need to refresh memory if you scale it to very, very small dimensions. Of course, this is dependent on technology. Some technologies like tape may be, mu may be much better in terms of retaining data. But if in, in at least the electronic technologies like this, you may actually have a problem. So if you actually etch some uh, thing onto a rock, do you need to refresh it? That's also memory, right? That's a very interesting storage device that's been around for, I don't know, thousands and thousands of years, etching something on a rock. Maybe you do need to refresh it, right? <laughs> anyway, OK. So one example of this is phase change memory. This is actually a really old technology. It's not emerging. It had emerged in the past, but not in the form of main memory. Uh, in fact, um, you've used, I assume many of you used uh, rewritable CDs, right? Yeah, rewritable CDs use phase change memory as a technology. Basically, uh, what this does is it was developed in the 1960s. Uh, it, it, it stores charge by changing the phase of material, some material. One example is chalcogenite glass. And you read data by detecting that material's resistance. There is no charge associated with it. Now, if you want to know more about the material, wait for the later lecture, or you can do some reading on your own on, uh, on the papers that I'll talk about in a little bit. Not talk about, show you in a little bit. But basically, 
uh, this was, uh, you have two resistance levels. One is high and one is low. So you can detect the resistance of it. But in the rewritable CDs, you actually have two different state, uh, well, you have two different states that have two different resistance levels. But you, these two different states also have two, uh, different optical reflexivities. Meaning that if you shine light on it, you get a different uh, output based on the state that the cell is in. That's exactly how the rewritable CDs work, but that reading process is very slow. That's essentially your read device, right? Shining light on the thing. Today, people have developed read devices that can detect the resistance reliably and much, much more quickly. As a result, this has become very interesting, and all technology has become really interesting because people, the, the, if, if you will, the, the uh, storage device didn't change, but the access device changed. So the access device has become much more reliable and faster and different. IBM actually did a lot of work in this, so they, they, I, I believe they should really get the credit for making this work. Uh, although other people didn't publish, so maybe IBM published and they should get the credit because of publishing, right? <laughs> so this is expected to scale to much lower nanometers than DRAM. Remember, at the same time, ITRS predicted that DRAM will not go easily scale below 35 nanometers. They also predicted that they uh, scale, uh, phase change memory will scale to 9 nanometers. The expectations are even lower now. I mean, expectations are higher, meaning that uh, the sc scalability is going to be to even lower dimensions. And this was actually prototyped at 20 nanometers by IBM. And this is a beautiful paper that talks about the lower levels of the technology in IBM Journal of Research and Development. So if you're interested, you should definitely read that paper. And it's also expected to be denser than DRAM for another reason, not only because uh, you can make the cell much smaller, but you can store the cell uh, multiple bits per cell. Instead of having one bit, like in DRAM, in DRAM, if you want to store multiple bits in a single capacitor, you need to divide the, capacitor, uh, the, divide the charge level into four, right, if you want to store two bits. Now, that's very difficult to do, actually. Your sense amplifier becomes crazily complex if you want to do that. But in this case, the resistance range is very large, so you can actually divide into four, divide into eight, such that you can store two bits, three bits per cell, just like flash. Today's flash actually stores three bits per cell. Uh, and people are looking into more. more. Okay, the problem is these emerging technologies, including phase change memory, phase change memory is just one example, have other shortcomings. And latency, energy, endurance, they're all shortcomings. For example, you write to a phase change memory cell 10 to the 8 times, and you cannot write to it anymore, just like flash. It has this endurance problem. Not all technologies have the same problems. The key question is, can we somehow enable them to replace, augment, or maybe even surpass the year, right? So we're going to talk about that. But I think this gives you an overview, and these are some of the papers that you may be interested in. So this is the, uh, I think going forward, this is really what things will look like. Remember, talking about hybrid cache management, that's one of the reasons why I started that way. And we want probably hybrid memory systems as well, because there is no single technology. If you, if you list all of the dimensions that you want from memory, uh, in terms of metrics, and if you list all the technologies that we have available or emerging, there is no single technology that's the best or green, at least green at everything. <laughs> green meaning reasonably good. Some techno uh, DRAM, for example, is fast and durable, but it has other issues. It's expensive. As a result, it has to be small. Uh, it's leaky. It's volatile. Some other technology, like PCM, can be large, non-volatile, low cost, but it's slow. It's energy inefficient in terms of active energy. It's energy, inefficient in terms of energy efficient in terms of static energy because you don't need to refresh it, but it also wears out. So if you have different technologies like this to get the best of both worlds, perhaps you put them together and design the hardware and the software to manage the data allocation and movement to achieve the greens as much as possible while avoiding the reds as much as possible. Right? So that's what, where systems are actually headed today. Today this is happening in the DRAM space, for example. Maybe we don't perfectly have this new technology, PCM, but you can think of this as high capacity, uh, low capacity, uh, I shouldn't say the red ones first, the fast DRAM, high bandwidth DRAM, but it's low capacity uh, because it may be 3D stacked. And some other DRAM that's larger, low, lower cost, but slower, uh, and uh, what did I say? And slower and lower bandwidth. So we can actually have two different types of DRAM in the system. And this is already happening in the GPU space. It will happen. It's going to happen in, uh, existing sp uh, in, in, in the multi-core space also. But it could actually increase. So it's good to get prepared for the heterogeneous memory technologies. 
Let me give you one example. So we're going to cover uh, in this course both DRAM and this other technologies as well. But let me give you one example just to stretch your minds. Remember I said embracing it is a possibility, right? How could we embrace unreliable memory? So if you look at this uh, abstract picture, what this shows is uh, different data in a given application and the memory error vulnerability of that data. What does vulnerability mean? For example, uh, how much does a user care <laughs> about a bit flip in that particular data structure, let's say. Now, if your data structure is a pixel uh, in your video, maybe you don't really care, right? <laughs> If it just changes a pixel that you don't, you're not even going to notice, right? Maybe when you're watching my videos, if there are a thousand errors in that video, you don't care, right? As long as you can read what's going on. So that error vulnerability of some data is really low, actually. Whereas some other data, if you get a bit flip in that data, the system crashes, right? Think about a page table entry, for example. Or you get a vulnerability, like security vulnerability. Or you get completely bogus data, right? For example, the index of your database. Maybe that's not a good idea where, uh, where you uh, to get errors in. So clearly there is a vulnerability difference between different data in programs. Also different programs as well, but even data within a program. So if we can somehow quantify that, and let's assume somebody magically does this, prob probably the programmer, uh, says this is vulnerable data and this is error tolerant data, perhaps you can map that data to different memory systems or different memory modules. One could be reliable memory, and the other could be low cost and less reliable memory. So we call this the heterogeneous reliability memory. That's one example of hybrid memory. But this could be high cost, but very well protected, very well tested chips. You keep testing them so your cost high, goes high. By the way, if you're asking where the cost, one of, uh, uh, the real cost of manufacturing these chips today comes from the testing, really. So microprocessors, for example, uh, about 50% uh, of the cost and the time also is spent on testing. In DRAM, it's worse. The testing is actually more than 70% today. Even despite all of this testing, things like row hammer get out. Right? So you can see the t testing and verification is really the, the, the biggest, most costly aspect of manufacturing today. So if you can get them <laughs> not so tested not so much, Maybe you have more errors, okay, but my data is tolerant, right? Maybe you have very coarse grain error detection, right? You have a very coarse grain parity, for example, across the entire memory, and then you figure out what's going on wrong. So that's another possibility, right, if you, if you want to tolerate a little bit of error. But that's, that's expensive, of course. Uh, well, the, the latency of uh, fixing that error is expensive, but maybe at least you have an idea, oh, there's an error, right? So if you can do this, you can actually get some benefits. So uh, we've done the study uh, with Microsoft. One of my students, Yishin, went there and modified their web search workload. And uh, what, what, what these big data center companies today do is they employ ECC. So for various reasons, they don't want to deal with memory errors. They basically buy all of their servers with error correcting codes. And if you look at the cost of error correcting codes, uh, it's expensive. <laughs> it basically adds 12.5% area to your DRAM module. Uh, and if you really want higher error correcting codes, you actually need to add more. Like, and the, this paper describes different error correcting codes, and if you have a lecture, we'll talk about that also. But uh, if you go to Microsoft, Facebook, Google, Twitter, they all employ error correcting codes in their data centers, which makes sense, I think, because they don't want to deal with these errors, right? You know, even, even uh, if, uh, actually, there was a really nice talk uh, at, the dependent, at the same conference that this work was presented at by Google. One of the Google engineers uh, said that we employ error correcting codes, but even then uh, we see memory errors, and it took us about nine months to debug a single uh, problem, and it turned out it's a memory error. <laughs> so <laughs> if, you, if your hardware is not reliable, then there's a problem. So I, I don't remember the name of the engineer or the, uh, or, the, uh, or the name of the talk, but it was a very nice talk at this conference, so you can perhaps link it if, if something exists that. So basically what Yishin did uh, with the Microsoft Web Search workload is he manually partitioned the data. He did the hard work to figure out what's vulnerable and what's tolerant. Of course, that's a judgment call also. And he changed the Web Search workload and such that the tolerant data goes to low-cost memory and vulnerable data goes to reliable memory. And if you do that, you can get rid of a lot of the ECC that's in the system, error-correcting code. That was one of our targets. 
uh, and you can reduce the hardware cost by, by a significant amount, about 5% in this case. Remember, 5% is an important number. <laughs> we'll get back to that. And you can still achieve a single server availability target of 99.9%. .9%. So basically, you're, you can, because of errors, you will get errors clearly, but still you're available most of the time. And if you actually design your application, this is a distributed application, right? Web searches, you can actually scale it. If you actually design it such that you can tolerate errors at the larger scale, at the program level, at the algorithm level, then you can actually increase your availability much more by reducing your hardware cost. But you can also think of this as if you reduce your hardware cost this much, you can actually add more memory, add real capacity into your system. Basically, you're getting rid of the ECC in your system. If you want to keep the same cost, you can add 4.7% more real memory in your system, right? That enables your application to be bigger, right? You're not wasting the memory space for reliability. So reducing cost is always good for increasing the scalability of your system. Okay, so if you're interested in this, uh, you should take a look at this paper. It's not required again. I'll, I'll give you a lot of references over here, but that's, that's what this, this paper introduces, heterogeneous reliability memory. And I think there's a huge design space only in heterogeneous reliability memory, but also in heterogeneous memory itself, because heterogeneous memory could be anything, right? Not just reliability, but latency, dot, dot, dot. Okay, let me give you this one, and then uh, let me see. Okay, we still have some time. I'll give you a break at 15. So I've discussed a lot of issues. One other issue with memory, we briefly discussed with caches also, is interference. So when you have cores that are sharing main memory, you can put a lot of accelerators over here also, they basically are sharing a medium, right? When they share that medium, they interfere with each other. When one core's request is getting serviced by a bank, for example, another core's request may be delayed. And we've seen this in the memory performance attacks that we've discussed. And uncontrolled interference leads to many problems, quality of service, performance. You, in a data center, for example, if you want to consolidate applications, this application that's really important may get delayed by some other application that's not important, so you may actually violate your service level agreement guarantees. Because the memory doesn't support quality of service today, a lot of uh, data center folks are actually very reluctant on consolidating more. As a result, their data centers are not very well utilized. So what they do is they put applications that are really, that have tight service level agreements that require some good performance alone on the system, even though the system may not be utilized, basically. Uh, but if you actually had some support in memory saying you could actually uh, prioritize the applications according to the service level agreements, then you could actually do much better. So there's a lot of wastage that happens in the system because there's interference in the main memory that gets uncontrolled and that has huge implications on the software stack because people cannot consolidate things if you have a server performance requirement from this application. You cannot co-locate that application together with some other application. That may potentially cause this application to violate the performance requirement. Right. So now you see, because the hardware is, has this interference problem, software is designed such that it doesn't co-locate, operating system is designed such that it doesn't co-locate applications, that leads to huge inefficiency at the higher level because you may have a lot of cores, but you're using two of them maybe <laughs> out of a thousand cores because you don't, you're not consolidating because of that performance requirement. So that's essentially what's happening today. Today, memory interference between cores is uncontrolled. We're going to get back to caches also. Caches, people are adding controls, but we'll talk about that. Uh, and this leads to unfairness, starvation, and low performance. Remember the memory performance attacks. And as a result, you get an uncontrollable system, unpredictable system, and vulnerable system that are... Uh, that are vulnerable to attacks. So the solution uh, we're going to talk about is quality of, making the memory, ser memory system more quality of service aware. That's kind of obvious, right? Designing the hardware to provide a configurable substrate that's fair and that can be controllable by the software. And we'll talk about a bunch of issues over here, including caching. And the software will be designed to configure the resources to satisfy different quality of service goals. The software can say this application gets uh, should be prioritized such that it achieves its performance bound, right? Performance target. Or if it's achieving its performance target at this point, don't give more resources to this application, right? Because it has a lot of slack in its performance target. So you can use those resources to, for some other application that may or may, that may not be achieving its performance bound. So you can actually make these decisions at the software level if, if the hardware provides a good substrate. Okay, and we'll, we'll see some examples. So this problem is getting worse. Uh, so this is one example of a system. 
uh, if you actually have a bunch of agents that look like this, they may be sharing some caches. Actually, in some systems, GPUs and CPUs are sharing caches, and they may be sharing caches at other levels also. And there are multiple threads over here that are sharing the L1 cache as well. Uh, and they may be sharing the memory controllers, and the memory itself is heterogeneous also. So how do you make sense out of the system? And you have this problem actually already in this. This looks like this, I think. <laughs> Although I cannot see the inside of this at the moment. But, <laughs> but basically, a cell phone is a perfect example of this. You have heterogeneous agents, and you have interference between all of these heterogeneous agents at cache level, interconnect level, memory level, dot, dot, dot. The key question is, how do you allocate the resources, caches, interconnect, memory, both in terms of latency, bandwidth, uh, capacity, as we will talk about, to mitigate the interference that's happening and to provide predictable performance for those applications that need it and to maximize the system performance. So that's a big problem in today's systems because that really determines your efficiency in the end. If while you're actually doing a really important task on your phone, your virus checker takes all of the bandwidth, then you have a problem, right? That's why the phones are actually one of the first to incorporate these quality of service of our memory controllers that we will talk about. Okay, uh, so I'm going to skip this. This is just to give you an idea of some of the papers. We're going to get back to this uh, later on. But this is a really good point to take a uh, break, unless there is a really burning question. Okay, I'll give you a seven-minute break. <laughs> All right, I think we can start. We, have, we had one minute margin. <laughs> That's eight minutes total. And that's exactly like the memory interface today, basically. I advertise that you'll have a six-minute break, but you get eight minutes. I guess the memory interface is a little bit different. It's advertised that the latency is 50 nanoseconds, but the real latency is 10 nanoseconds internally. So there's a lot of waste. Okay, so we stopped here. If you're interested in this dimension, quality of service, you can take a look at uh, these works. I'm not going to cover it again, but we're going to get back to quality of service, both in terms of caches as well as memory system and resource management in general uh, later on. But now let's answer this question. I guess how can we fix the memory problem and design memory systems of the future? To be able to do that, I think you need to really understand what's going on underneath, as we've discussed, right? So we first need to understand the principles of memory and DRAM, and that's what we're going to spend some time on for the rest of this lecture and probably in the next lecture. And memory controllers also. How is it done today and how it can be done? And techniques for reducing and tolerating memory latency. Again, these can be reordered, but this is really important also. Uh, and potential memory technologies that can compete with DRAM. Maybe that's not the best way of posing it, but potential memory technologies that are good, that could be useful. Okay, so let's start with the main memory. Uh, and main memory is actually really simple. It looks like this. <laughs> Basically, this is the abstraction. You can abstract the memory system like this. You basically supply an address. I'm even ignoring the command at this point. It's an m-bit address, and you get a k-bit of data. And you need to enable a chip, maybe write enable if you want to write the data, actually. Right. So this is, of course, you may need some other things, but this is my abstraction. And memory system is interesting because as you go, as you peel it, you'll see stuff that looks like this internally. At the high level, abstraction, it may look like this. If you think about DRAM, for example, I have, a, I don't know how big, how big of a memory you guys have, but this is 8 gigabytes, I think. So you basically have two to the n times whatever data that I'm getting. It's, uh, in, in a DRAM interface today, I'm getting 64 bits in one cycle. So this is 64, and this is, uh, now you can make the division, right? <laughs> eight gigabytes divided by 64. <laughs> eight gigabytes divided by eight, it's really one gigabyte times k. That's the abstraction, right? The abstraction is that I'm getting 64 bits of data from an eight gigabyte memory, uh, or I'm writing to it, right? But internally, it's really composed of many, many smaller things that look like this. Just like we've seen, the bank abstraction earlier, right? Bank, uh, you have a monolithic memory, you divide it into smaller banks. Right? Even the bank abstraction is an abstraction, actually, as we will see in DRAM. When you call a bank, it's not a monolithic physical structure. Even that is divided into smaller things called mats or sub-arrays. Basically, you have sub-banks inside there 
Because if you have a monolithic bank that has 32,000 rows in the bit line, that bit line is really slow. So it's really divided into 32, 1,000 bit lines, subarrays. And you really read a subarray when you read it, amplify the data, and drive it with big bit lines, some other bit lines outside. So all of memory is really, you start with this and you divide it such that it's, it gives you good latency, good bandwidth, good performance in the end. But that's the abstraction. For example, it's a memory chip. You can enable that chip. You can write enable to it. And this is the bank abstraction also, right? If it, just to give you the analogy with this, a bank looks like this, right? Basically, we've seen this before. This is the memory bank organization. You need to supply some row address and the column address, and you activate a row, which brings the data, and then you max out the data using the column address. That's it. And we've seen this in DRAM, as you know. Uh, this is SRAM, sorry. We've seen this in SRAM, <laughs> and we've seen this in DRAM. These are from previous lectures. The, the differences are relatively small if you look at it, right? And SRAM also actually, this may look like a bank, but it's internally it's divided into smaller things. But DRAM, as you can see, one difference that we've discussed is you don't supply the uh, uh, row address and the column address at the same time. Whereas here, you supply the row address and the column address potentially at the same time. But in DRAM, you don't supply at the same time because you have a chip boundary over here. And if you actually supply both of them at the same time, what would happen is you need more address bits, meaning you need more pins, your chip is more expensive. So you supply it in consecutive cycles, for example, or you can supply it together with consecutive commands. Activate commands bring, brings the address of the row, and uh, a read command brings the address of the column. Right. Okay, so all memory looks like this. Uh, internally, it may be different cells. And actually, this is the phase change memory cell. Let me take an aside very quickly again. Phase change memory cell is usually depicted this way. You have a heater that heats the material at very high degrees Celsius, 650 degrees Celsius, for example. And you, by heating, changing the material, uh, by heating, you change the phase of the material and you change the states. But even this, if you want to put it into a memory, it looks like this, basically. You have a word line and a bit line and an access device, and you need to bring the data into some sort of sense amplifier and sense it. Sense amplifier will be very different because of the technology, but it looks like this. And you're still limited by the same problems. If your bit line is too long, your latency is too long. So instead of having a huge monolithic thing, you partition it into smaller things. Okay. So we've seen this also. So let's talk about some fundamental concepts in memory before we go more. So physical address space, hopefully you guys know this. This is the maximum size of main memory. Total number of uniquely identifiable locations, basically. Kind of obvious. Physical addressability, the minimum size of data in memory uh, that can be addressed. Uh, but you can have byte addressability, word addressability, and 64-bit addressability, for example. And this is also a property of the ISA, right, for example. But this is not only, uh, so this is, you can, you can have the addressability of a chip as well, right? The addressability that you have in the ISA may be different than the addressability that you have in the chip. For example, a chip can provide you only four bits, potentially. But you put together 16 of these chips to get four bits, uh, to get 64 bits total, right? Does that make sense? <laughs> okay. Okay. That's obvious. So uh, yeah, this is what I said basically. Microarchitectural addressability depends on the abstraction level of the implementation. Uh, maybe this is a bunch of words over here. <laughs> but uh, for example, uh, if uh, uh, today the DRAM interface is 64 bits, uh, and uh, what happens at the, uh, when the processor issues a memory request, it really requests a cache block, right? A cache block, let's say, 64 bytes, which means that it needs to do eight memory accesses eight of these 64 bits to get data out of DRAM, right? to get a single cache block with a 64-bit interface. So it really depends on the abstraction level implementation, where you're looking at, and also what you're looking at. So internally in the DRAM chip, in a single DRAM chip, you don't supply 64 bits because 64 bits actually is too much because you need 64 data pins, and these data pins are actually really large. So a single DRAM chip today uh, can supply data with uh, only at the 4-bit 
level or 8-bit level or 16-bit level. And there are some cases where you have 32-bit chips, but those are expensive. So what you do is you, do, you put together multiple chips in a DIMM, dual inline memory module, and you operate them concurrently, such that if you want to get 64 bits, and if your chip supplies four bits, you have 16 of them. If you want to get 64 bits, and if your chip, chip supplies eight bits, you have 88 of them. So most memory DIMMs that you know of probably have eight of these chips, right? If you look at a DRAM module, it has eight. That's the reason why it has eight. You want to get 64 bits because that's what the processor bus is, and each chip supplies eight bits. That's what's called a rank, actually. So it's a rank of soldiers. You can think of the chips as a rank of soldiers that respond to the same command. Right? <laughs> That's very simple, actually. But it's, it's all really driven by the cost. The reason you don't get 64 bits out of this DRAM chip, or even 64 bytes out of the DRAM chip, is its cost. You're really, you're, you, you, you don't want to add more pins to that chip. You can, but you have to pay money. Okay, and at some point, actually, you don't have enough space in the boundary of the chip to add enough pins, right? <laughs> okay, so alignment is another issue. Does the hardware support unaligned access transparently to software? We're not going to cover that in this course as much. You can go back to our uh, digital circuits course, which we've covered. And another question is, does the ISA even support unaligned access, right? But suffice it to say that... Uh, 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 Let's say uh, if your, your ISA supports unaligned accesses uh, and you want, uh, you, you want a byte that spans, uh, let's say you want, you want, you want uh, two bytes from this cache line and you want two bytes from this cache line. How do you do that? They, uh, it maps to two different cache lines. Uh, basically, the, the, the four bytes that you're trying to access with a load maps to two different cache lines. What do you do? Well, you need to have two memory requests, right? You need to access two, ca two cache blocks. So that's the problem with unaligned access. That's one example of an unaligned access. That's not the only example. Uh, but this, this complicates the design of memory because who does this? Who supports this? Do you punt on the software such that software says, so I'm not supporting any alignment, any unaligned accesses. Do it yourself. Make sure you align your data. That's one possibility. Or I'm supporting this. Now, whenever you get an address, you need to have a state machine that figures out where the data is and brings back two cache lines, for example. Right? And this becomes more complicated even with uh, virtual memory. And interleaving we've already talked about, right? And interleaving is a very fundamental concept that I'm, I repeated over here. It's, it's banking, basically. Okay, so this is the interleaving example with my handwriting. I guess if we need to have more handwriting, we're going to use this one later on. But <laughs> so far, we haven't needed it. So interleaving, uh, basically, this is uh, the same concept that we've discussed before. A assume each bank supplies a word. Uh, in this case, a word is 32 bits. I just made it up. It doesn't have to be. Uh, but basically, this is what uh, the banking that I described in words earlier was. You have a single bus. This is a data bus in this case. It's four bytes. And each bank can supply 32 bits, four bytes, but only one bank can drive the data bus. So this is the gate, this is the gating logic. Uh, for example, if you've started access to this bank and if you are waiting for data, you enable this one and the data goes back to the data bus. And in the next cycle, you can enable this one and the data goes this way. But these two banks can operate in parallel, right? You, can, you, you cannot, so if, I didn't draw the address bus over here, but you can imagine the address bus Exactly like this, but going the other way. The gating is actually, the gating logic is that way and this way over here. But basically what happens over here is you send the address to only one bank in a given cycle. You start the access. In the next cycle, you send the address to the other bank, another address, and then you can start the access for the next word in that case. Uh, and then the, both of the accesses happen in parallel, and then this bank returns the data, and then you need to enable this and get the data back, and then in the next cycle, this bank returns data, and uh, you, gate, uh, you gate the output of that bank to the data bus, and then you get the word out of it. So this is one way. This is how DRAM is, actually. Maybe not exactly like this, but it has a single bus, single data bus, single address bus, separate, going to these chips, and single command bus going to these chips. So they, the, 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 the banks actually share uh, the address command and data buses. Of course, we have the interleaving problem as we've discussed earlier, right? How do you, what granularity do you interleave at? Do you interleave the first word here 
uh, like address, uh, if, you, if you have word addressable IS, ISA, uh, address zero here, address one here, address two here, address three here, dot, dot, dot. Do you do that ping-ponging in the interleaving? That's called fine-grained interleaving. Or do you do it more coarse-grained, as we've discussed, right? The top bit of the 32-bit address determines where the data is. Okay, that's an example. Uh, again, with my handwriting, assume this is your physical address, 13 bits. Again, I just made it up. Uh, assume you have uh, a four-byte word. This is byte addressable. Uh, this two, these two bits determine which byte in the word you're addressing. And, for example, you can select this bit to choose the bank. Right? If you select that bit, then the first address zero is in this bank, address one is in this bank, address two is here, address three is here. So you're doing fine-grained interleaving. You're choosing a lower order address bit. But you could choose a higher order address bit to be your bank bit. In that case, half of uh, the, the first half of the physical address space gets mapped to the bank zero. The second half goes to bank one. Or you could choose a random bit inside here, right? So that's, now this clearly determines where your bits are. And this also determines your conflicts, bank conflict access patterns. OK, we're going to get back to that. So some questions and concepts. Actually, this, is, this, this makes more sense if you've taken digital circuits with me. And nobody has here, because those guys are still taking second year, third year classes, I assume. That's OK. But uh, I can remind you that there is a lecture in digital circuits uh, that uh, we covered Cray-1. Cray-1 is one of the earliest supercomputers. Uh, and among other really interesting characteristics of the supercomputers, one of the characteristics was it had a memory that had 16 banks. And there was a good reason why they had 16 bank memory. Because this is a vector processor. This actually can do multiple memory accesses per cycle very, very easily because it's operating on huge vectors. Uh, but it turned out the bank access latency was 11 cycles. But they had so much memory par parallelism. Now, it makes no sense if you have a single bank, you would wait 11 cycles. And only after that, you can issue the next access. So they wanted to sustain uh, one access per cycle. So if you want to sustain that, how many banks do you need? Well, the answer is 16. Because eight doesn't work. Right? If you have eight banks, and if your bank access latency is 11 cycles, you need to stall for three cycles to start some other access, right? Because you can start one access every 11 cycles for a given bank. But if you have 16 banks, if your data is mapped nicely, of course, assuming you have no bank conflicts, then you can start one access every, uh, every cycle and then get data for one access every cycle, right? Because basically, you need to have enough banks, uh, banks greater than the number of cycles that are required for the bank access latency. Actually, you could do 11, but the problem with 11 is, as we discussed last time, is your addressing becomes complicated, right? 16 is a lot easier. <laughs> you could have 32 also, right? Okay, so that's basically, uh, and what they did was they did word interleaving, essentially. At that time, they interleaved words. We'll, we're going to look at today's DRAM systems. They interleave at the row granularity, for example, or cache block granularity. So word granularity is long gone. Uh, in existing systems. It happens in some embedded systems, actually, because some cases where you, you there are many cases where uh, some of the accelerators, for example, need to access very small amounts of data, not, not cache line, cache block data. There you can actually do smaller uh, size accesses. But in modern systems, this, for example, is doing cache block accesses to memory. So that it makes no sense to really interleave below the granularity of a cache block. Okay. So the other question we've already uh, uh, discussed is, so clearly their design over here cannot have 16 accesses per cycle, right? Because the memory actually shares this bus like we've seen over here. The, the different banks share the uh, data bus and address bus and command buses. Again, because of cost reasons. So certainly you could potentially design a memory system that can fully supply all of the uh, accesses at the same time, multiple accesses started per cycle and finished per cycle. But that comes at a cost, as we've seen it earlier. So uh, because of that, as we've discussed, DRAM banks share buses. Its cost is very important over there, whereas L1 data caches have multiple fully independent banks. So you don't serialize accesses to different banks. There is not a single data pass. For example, uh, you have a crossbar between the cores to uh, the L2 cache also in some, uh, in some designs. 
uh, for Sun Niagara, for example, had a crossbar between eight cores and eight different L2 banks. But L1 is even, um, even more latency critical, so they have multiple fully independent banks. And that's true for the register files also. But as you get far away from the processor, cost becomes a bigger concern because these buses are actually much bigger also at that point. Okay, so this is the bank abstraction. Uh, as I've shown you, it's very similar, right? This is bank zero. <laughs> it, it, it supplies you 32 bits, for example, 1K rows. Uh, this should actually be 32K, for example. But even this is an abstraction, actually. I mean, this is an abstraction in multiple different ways. One is it could actually be smaller. There are sub-banks, as, as I've discussed, and as we will talk about, I'll give you a reference to it also. But uh, you don't get 32 bits at a time, as we've discussed, right? This really comes from uh, different chips, as I said. Because this 32 bits is costly if it comes from a single chip. So you actually, what you do is you have four different chips, each providing eight bits. And this is called a rank. And in this case, uh, only bank zero is shown of the rank. It's actually, you can have another, other banks in each chip. So this is one chip, there's another chip, another chip, another chip. They're all supplying different eight bits of the 32 bit that you're looking for. And you have a single chip enable for them. So you don't enable each one of them individually, but you have an enable signal going through all of them. That's why they're called a rank. It's like a rank of soldiers again, right? You give a command, all of them are supposed to do the same thing. That's essentially what they're doing. You give a command, all of them are enabled at the same time, and all of them are giving you data, except they're giving different pieces of the 32 bits. Okay, and we've discussed everything over here. You can read this uh, on your own. Right? Basically, the idea is to produce an 8-bit per chin, pin chip, but control, operate them as a rank so that we can get 32 bits in a single read. Because producing a 32-bit per, per pin chip uh, is uh, expensive. 32 pin chip is expensive. That's... Okay, any questions? Now we'll go into more, a little bit more detail. Yeah? <laughs> okay. All right. So this is another uh, view of the thing because uh, we're going to actually go... Uh, I think it'll be top down and bottom up. I'm not sure. We'll see. We'll do the top down later. Uh, so basically, uh, you start with a channel. Actually, there are multiple channels also. But channel is what the processor is connected to. And each channel can have multiple DIMMs. I like thinking of DIMMs as modules, dual inline memory module. And each DIMM has a bunch of ranks, usually one these days. Uh, each rank is consist, uh, consists of chips, as we've just shown. Each chip consists of multiple banks. So I haven't shown that over here, but if you draw the chip boundary over here, it actually consists of, let's say, eight banks over here. Uh, and each bank consists of rows and columns. And as you've seen, each row, uh, each, uh, this two-dimensional structure consists of a single cell at the cross point, right? Okay, let's start with the uh, bank as we've done before. But a DRAM bank is a two-dimensional array of cells, rows by columns. Uh, unfortunately, a DRAM row is also called a DRAM page. Somebody at some point decided that it's nice to call it a page without thinking about the virtual memory subsystem where things are also called a page. So if you see page in the terminology in DRAM, that's DRAM page. That's not a virtual memory page, which is different. It can be the same size, potentially, but... Usually not. <laughs> they don't have to be, basically. Sense amplifiers are also called the row buffer. So each address that you issue to a DRAM chip is a row column pair, basically, in today's DRAM. Now, if I was giving this lecture 10 years ago, I would be talking about some weird forms of DRAM, and I'm happy that I'm not giving this lecture 10 years ago, <laughs> or maybe even, even 20 years ago. There were so many different types of weird DRAM, but this is the one that has dominated uh, the field today, which doesn't mean that it's going to dominate the field later on. Uh, but basically, uh, we, as we've seen before, uh, initially you have a row that's closed, row buffer that doesn't contain anything. And if you want to access that row uh, and the row buffer doesn't contain anything, you need to activate. This activate command opens the row, which places the row into the row buffer, as we've seen again. And then you can issue a read and write. This read and write command reads uh, or writes the column in the row buffer. Simple. And then if you want to access another row after that, you need to pre-charge. You need to issue a pre-charge command that closes the row and prepares the bank for the next access. Basically, pre-charge is a bit line such that you can sense the next access. And these are very well described in the required readings that I mentioned, the chapters one and two of the TLDRM and self papers. That goes into very clearly described with, in a few pages very quickly. So if you access an open row, open row means the row is already in the row buffer, 
As again, we, we've seen before, there's no need for the activate command. Right? You can just simply issue a read and write command giving the column address. Okay, this is a view of the DRAM chip internally. Uh, well, actually, it's a DRAM bank here, but you can imagine the DRAM chip also. It's really a combination of these banks. Uh, but basically, you get the address from the DRAM controller. It gets latched into this row address latch. In this case, it's 14 bits. It doesn't have to be. It depends on the DRAM. Uh, and the DRAM bank has two of the 14 rows in this case and two of the 10 columns, as you can see. So as a result, it bank stores two of the 24 bytes over here. And you get the data here, which gets amplified in this row buffer. And later, after you activate the data, it gets into the row buffer. You can send the column address. It gets latched again. Uh, and then uh, you also send a command, read or write, for example. Uh, well, if you're doing reading, basically you mux out the data, the eight bits that you want based on the address, and that goes back to the DRAM controller. And eight of these chips operate in parallel so that you get 64 bits. And this is where the command comes, but I didn't route the command over here to not complicate this. As we've discussed, our DRAM chip consists of multiple of these banks sharing address, data, and command buses. Is there anything else that I want to say over here? And as you know, this is an abstraction as well. So you clear, uh, if you think about this, it's a lot of interconnect, right? It's a long interconnect. That's exactly why you don't have uh, even two to, the, two to the 14. Some banks actually have two to the 15 rows today. Uh, but this bank is subdivided internally into sub-banks. And whenever you access, you really access a sub-bank. But that sub-bank is not visible today to the memory controller, although we are trying to make that visible. Uh, so what happens is you have very little interconnect to activate uh, the row. So you actually have row buffers that I didn't show you over here, other sense amplifiers internally that exist over there, which is really interesting if you go into that. So a bank operation, I'm going to go through this really quickly because I've shown you this earlier, if you remember. You send the row address, which brings the data into the row buffer, that's the activate, and then you send the column address, and which gets the data out of the row buffer. Now, if your next access is to the same row, you get a row buffer hit, you don't need to send the activate, you send the column address and the read command. If the next access is to the same row buffer, row again, row zero, you get a hit in the row buffer again, and you send the column address. Clearly, somebody needs to keep track of this row buffer, right? What's open in this bank, and that's the memory controller. And if you get another address, uh, to a different row, now you need to pre-charge the array, which closes the row buffer. This is called the row buffer conflict. And it takes time to pre-charge the array. And you activate row 1, which brings the data into the row, and then row buffer, and then you issue a column address and get the data that you want. Okay, it's pretty simple, basically. That's how the bank operates. The memory controller needs to ensure that this operates correctly, of course, and there are timing parameters related to this. The timing, there's a timing parameter saying, after I issue the activate, I have to wait by this much to issue the read command. After I issue the read command, I have to wait this much until I can pre-charge the arrays. And there are a bunch of these timing parameters in the DRAM chip today. It's there, there, there's so many timing parameters so that the controller can optimize, but that makes the controller complicated as well, so there's a trade-off over there. It didn't always used to be this way. 30 years ago, there was asynchronous DRAM, where you could send a command and you would wait and the DRAM would return data and say, I've done. I'm, do I, I, I'm done with what you wanted me to do. Right. That's another protocol, right? But today people moved to the synchronous DRAM because it was easier to design the circuitry and make it much, much faster. Asynchronous was hard. Uh, but maybe we may be going back to some asynchronous circuitry in the future. We'll see. Okay. So as we said, DRAM chip consists of multiple banks. Eight is a common number today. I think it's 16 in DDR4 or LPDDR4. I don't, I don't know, but it's, it's increasing also. It comes at a cost, though. There, there are weird things that people are adding. It's a, it's a very interesting space. It's not only a technical space, but it's a political space because somebody needs to agree on the interface, right? And these are very different uh, companies. Yes? Well, I di yeah, I didn't go into the detail of the circuit operation, but what really happens is when you actually activate, uh, you connect the word, uh, you connect uh, the capacitors to the bit line, all of the capacitors in that row to the bit line. So charge sharing happens, and what happens is the data gets destroyed in the row. You basically sense the data. You really destroy the data completely in the row. But then, after some point, sensing 
after you sense the data or while you're sensing the data, the sense amplifier kicks in. And one of the functions of the sense amplifier is to first amplify the data and figure out whether it's a one or zero or charged or discharged. And the second is once you amplify the data to restore the data into the cell. So the activate operation actually does all of this. It does restore the data back into the cell. And the, 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 the readings that I mentioned actually explain that very clearly. Okay, so banks share the command address data buses. We've said the chip itself is a narrow interface. So uh, changing the number of banks, size of the interface, pins, whether or not command address data buses are shared has significant impact on the DRM system cost. As a result, we are here, we are where we are in the historical uh, space or historical progression of memory. But this doesn't mean that this cannot be changed. Okay, so this is actually an old DRAM chip by now. This is from a data sheet, uh, I believe from a Micron data sheet, I don't remember. Uh, but you can see it's, uh, you can see what, uh, it's very similar to what I uh, drew of this, uh, I don't know, you can do the calculation. 128 meg by 8-bit DRAM chip. It's 8-bit because you have eight data out pins, as you can see over here, if you can read that. And you can see that there's an address register, there's a row address mux, as I've shown you, row address latch and decoder for different banks. Each bank is independent, as you can see, after this point. It's dependent at, the, at this point because they, cannot sh they have to share this logic, but here they don't, they don't have any sharing of the logic. And you have some column address, counter and latch. Uh, what else should I show you? And internally there's some prefetching that happens actually even though you, you want to put data out, uh, eight, 8 bits data, internally you prefetch data, so you see that the data path over here is 32 bits. Right? You fetch 32 bits, and then you store them, so the next access can be much faster. This is called burst mode in DRAM. You can basically have a burst. Uh, because internally you have some prefetching, uh, you don't just get, uh, the, the next 8 bits you get after one 8 bit access is much quicker. That's because of the prefetching, not because of the robot. For robot is another thing, right? Okay, so you get eight bits, but the next eight bits can be faster. Next eight bits can be faster. Next eight bits can be faster as long as you are within this 32 bits over here, because the data is supplied directly from this read latch. And write is very similar, also actually over here. Okay, we can we can study data sheets that look like this. It's fun, and also you can see that there's a refresh counter over here, right? And you basically, row address can come from. Uh, the external uh, address pins or internally generated refresh address. And as we've discussed today, what happens in DRAM is uh, the memory controller says refresh. It doesn't tell what parts of the DRAM to refresh. The memory controller just says refresh. And the uh, DRAM internally generates which addresses to refresh. And again, the protocol is the memory controller says refresh and waits for a while such that the DRAM refreshes itself. And the assumption is that DRAM does something to refresh uh, stuff. The memory controller just waits for that long. This is called TRFC, refresh cycle, basically. Okay, let's look at the rank and module a little bit. Uh, basically, we've, we've, just, we've said that multiple chips are operated together to form a wide interface. That's what a rank is. And all chips comprising a rank are controlled at the same time. They respond to a single command. I like the soldier analogy. Uh, you get kicked out of the army if you actually don't obey the command, right? That's, <laughs> you, 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 can, you, cannot, you cannot disobey the rank. <laughs> okay, uh, you share the address and command buses, but provide different data. So a DRAM module consists of one or more ranks. For example, a dual inline memory module. I, I, don't, I don't want to go into the detail of what's a dual inline, what's a single inline. It's not important, really. So basically, the module is what you plug into your motherboard. Uh, and if you have chips with 8-bit interface to read 8 bytes, uh, you use 8 chips in a DIMM. And this is one example, as you can see. This is 8 chips in a DIMM. And uh, they all share the command buses. They all share the data buses. Uh, yeah. No, no, they all, sorry, not share the data buses, but they have, uh, they share the command bus. This is not depicting it really well, unfortunately. What I drew, drew earlier was depicting it much better. They share the command bus, but they reply with different data, right? So they, you, you, they reply with eight different data points over, over here. Actually, this is a much better picture. <laughs> okay, but I think one thing over here, if you want to add error correcting codes, today what, how it's done is you actually add an error, another chip over here that stores error correcting codes. So if you actually ever have seen a nine chip thing, that's really an error correcting code DRAM. 
So it needs a wider interface so that you can get the error correcting code. So it's more expensive, not only because you have an extra chip, but also because the DIM becomes larger, right? Or the DIM requires more pins in this case, right, over here. Okay, so this is my pictorial view of a 64-bit wide DIM. As you can see, the command bus is shared, uh, but the addresses are actually, as you can see over here, you get different 8 bits from different chips, and you have a 64-bit wide channel over here, and the memory control, and the address bus is shared. I don't think it's clear in this picture. I should fix that picture. That's somebody else's picture. Okay, so what's the advantage of a rank, like uh, clubbing together uh, different chips like this? The advantage is now you can, have, you can both have higher capacity and wide interface, right? You're getting both. Actually, you have to get both, unfortunately. And also, a memory controller doesn't need to deal with individual chips anymore. The memory controller can say, oh, ba basically, it's operating at the 64-bit level, not 8-bit level. The disadvantage is that now granularity, right? Your accesses cannot be smaller than the interface width. What if you want just one byte? Well, too bad. You cannot get it because your DIM is designed to be 64 bits. Okay. So if you want to have increase your capacity, you add multiple DIMs. Again, this is an ugly picture, but that's okay. Basically, the idea is to have multiple DIMs and interconnect them some, somehow. This is a mesh topology if you follow it. Doesn't matter. Even if it's not a mesh topology, you can make it a mesh topology. Again, that's not important. What it looks like is not important. The, the, the fact is that you basically have a controller and you can have multiple DIMMs attached to it, interconnected in some manner. In fact, it could be a daisy chain. Daisy chain mean, meaning you have a single, ch a single connection here and then a buffer here, and then you send the command. Uh, if the command is not to this DIM, this DIM passes it along to the next one. If it's not to that DIM, it passes it along to that one. If it's not to that DIM, it passes it along to that one. That's called a daisy chain. Now, that's not the best way of designing an interconnect. Uh, in fact, there was this, uh, this DIM called fully buffered DIM that exactly operated that way, which is not around anymore, thankfully. <laughs> but that was basically uh, daisy chained. And the, fact, uh, the, the time it took to access this DIM was much longer than the time it took this, to access this DIM. And it's had all of other problems also, like power consumption. But basically, if you connect multiple DIMs, you get an even higher capacity. The disadvantage is always interconnect complexity and energy consumption. Right? So how do you get higher capacity is always a good question, right? The best way of getting capacity is really having a higher density chip. That's why people are trying to scale DRAM, right? We want to actually have much, much higher density chips such that you don't have to deal with this complexity. In fact, later we may see how other people deal with complexity. People actually add in, uh, memory controllers. I think uh, uh, IBM called it SMC, which I don't remember what SMC stands for right now, but scalable memory controller is a good, <laughs> good, uh, good, good guess probably. But basically, it, you, you add all of these intermediate memory controllers such that you can scale the capacity of memory. The problem is interconnect complexity and energy consumption and additional latency that you get. So scaling memory capacity is actually not easy. Okay. Okay, so DRAM channels, basically, you can have two independent channels, two memory controllers that look like this. In fact, most modern systems have multiple memory channels. Intel i7, I believe, has three memory channels, maybe four, I don't know now. Uh, these could be independent or dependent. Dependent means, let's say you have a 64-bit wide channel here. You have a single memory controller. It's not this picture. You have a single memory controller. 64 bits come from here. 64 bits come from here. If you want to get 128 bits at the same time, you can have two channels, right? operated in lockstep. It's not shown here. Uh, okay, and this is a generalized memory structure. So basically, it's an n-dimensional memory structure. You have a channel, you have multiple DIMMs, uh, multiple modules, and if you look at each module, it consists of multiple DRAM chips. Each chip consists of multiple banks. Each bank consists of columns slash rows, and that's where the cache line resides. Right? So it takes a while to get to your cache line. And I think I will uh, probably stop with this slide, but I will recommend, uh, this, is, this is another paper, this is a paper that talks about the subarrays in DRAM, but this is another view of the system. I think this is a, maybe a nicer view, right? You can see the channels, banks, ranks, but essentially this is what you have in your computers today. Uh, okay. So maybe this is a good place to stop, well, both right on time and right on the boundary. <laughs> Any burning questions? Okay, otherwise I'll see you either in the office hours tomorrow or next week. Have a good weekend.
Yeah. 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 